remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. All right, let me share my screen. Do that. All right. All right, yes, yes. Good morning, everybody. And this is also for the folks who won't be able to join us today uh, during this little two-hour window, but who will be uh, watching this watching. later for review purposes. Um, the final exam review sheet has been posted. And also the PowerPoint uh, for framing question five has been posted. Uh, Sankofa is uploading the video for framing question five. Uh, the conversation we had about framing question five last class, the two hour piece, uh, that will be uploaded today. And so that'll be available to anyone who hasn't seen it as well for an additional two Mbongis. Um, but let's, let's go through the review sheet which also has at the very beginning the format for the exam and the instructions for the exam that way everybody can we'll all be on the same page and i'll um i'll review this again near the end of class for the people who might not be able to to make it before then okay so here we are spring 2020 at the very beginning very very brief instruction uh, hmm, i hear echo Echo. All right, whoever that is, I can hear myself coming, coming back. Let's see, mute if you can. Otherwise, we're going to have to back through, and that's going to be very. There we go. Good look. Appreciate y'all. All right. The COVID 19 pandemic requires us to radically alter the format of our final examination. The exam uh, will consist of two essay questions worth 40% of the examination each and the multiple choice question text worth 20 percent oh that's a mistake there Let, i can edit in real time test y'all know i detest those kind of errors all right oh what just happened all right playing around i'll need to fix it i guess after yeah i won't try to save that's what i'll do am i still recording let me make sure i'm still recording i got a little cute with it yeah, okay. The COVID-19 pandemic requires us to radically alter the format of our final exam. The examination will consist of two essay questions worth 40% of the examination each. So essay question one, 40%, essay question two, 40%. And a multiple choice question, uh, multiple choice question test worth 20%. It's gonna be on Blackboard. The multiple choice exam portion of the final exam will be available on Blackboard from 10 a.m to 1 p.m. on Thursday, April 30th. So we're gonna move the final exam window we would normally have, which is eight to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, trying to be mindful of the folks who are on the West Coast and other time zones around the world it might be difficult, more difficult. We're gonna move it down to 10 to one, add an hour and move it down. It's only 20 questions, multiple choice. And uh, I'll check in near the end because I also know that obviously there's an exam schedule at the university and that by moving the exam, uh, we risk moving into somebody else's exam time. But if there are individuals who have that problem, we can address you all individually. I want to give you a little bit more time and also move it down some so that folks, you know, who are not in the eight to 10 window, uh, we have a little bit more flexibility. Um, but the exam will still be on the 30th, that little part of it, that little 20% the multiple choice, 10 to one. And uh, the essay portion will be due by later that night, Thursday, April 30th by 11.59. So 11.59, just before midnight, that same day, uh, the essay portion will be due. But next paragraph, the final exam, not but, but in addition, the final exam essays will be posted on Blackboard and sent to you by email on Friday, so that's tomorrow, Friday, April 24th. So you'll have from tomorrow until next Thursday, a uh, minute before midnight to answer the final exam. So that gives you six days. 
the two essay questions should be answered in no fewer than three and no more than six pages each. So each, page, each essay should be no shorter than three pages, no longer than six each, type double space, and submit it on Blackboard. And remember, Blackboard will check for plagiarism and the description and penalty for plagiarism stated on our syllabus remains the same. Everything else remains the same in terms of assignments. Draft, test, uh, draft text discussions, I mean, we talked about that on Tuesday. So um, let's see. Oh, I think when I hit that, I'm gonna move this here. All right, draft text discussions of framing questions four, five, and six will be posted on Blackboard on Monday, April 27th. Yeah, when I hit that, something else happened. Uh, the, the, the one you have is correct, but I'm just fixing what appeared to be happening when I tried to save while I was in Zoom. Draft text discussions of framing questions <clears throat> four, five, and six will be posted on Blackboard on Monday, April 27th. So in addition to your books and the PowerPoints and the lectures you have, which are very extensive for four and actually kind of inform five, and then the one, the two hour one we did on five and touching on six. Um, in addition to all that, Draft text discussions, the thing that I'm writing for you on framing questions four, five, and six will be posted on Blackboard on Monday, April 27th to give everyone more content to cite from in answering the essay questions and helping to study for the multiple choice section of the exam. Uh, review tip for the final, in addition to the assigned readings, pay particular attention to the PowerPoint slides for framing questions four through six. Anybody have any questions on the, uh, format for the exam or the materials that you can use to study for and help with the exam before we go into the actual review sheet. Um, I have a quick question. So framing question five is still due tomorrow, correct? Oh, wow. Did I, I think on Tuesday, I think I pushed it back to next week. In fact, the outstanding uh, framing questions we pushed everything back because the video hadn't been loaded yet. And okay. so, um, in fact, thank you for reminding me. In fact, let me make a note of that. I will put that out. I'll, I'll send an email out right when I get off before I go to my next Zoom, 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 I Zoom meeting. <laughs> I okay, will. Uh, thank you. No, no, thank somebody, you. Somebody mentioned May 1st, Professor. I know that's something you said originally. I did, I did, I did. That's what I have written down, May 1st. Yeah, okay. and that's and that's what I should have written down right after we got out because that, that is what we uh talked about. May the first is that Friday, right? Friday, uh, May first. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's that's exactly what we said. We moved it back. Friday, May first. Next question. Is framing question six optional? It absolutely is optional. Yeah, you don't have to do it. Remember, we okay. talked about that um on the call uh on Alpha Stars, maybe not this week. But last week, last Tuesday, I think. Okay. I've been jumping from class to class because it's the same time. Thank you. <laughs> I understand, sweetheart. Yeah, I'm sorry. And again, again, thank you all because we, the only reason we're doing it now instead of earlier, of course, is for the West Coast folks. So, yes. In fact, I'll put this in the email. Everything, framing questions five, framing questions six, uh, yes, turn those in. Have everything turned in by uh, the co-curricular Mbongis, the Mbongis, four framing questions five uh, for the videos that are on Sankofa. You can have those turned in by the 1st of May, by first midnight the 1st of, of May. Quick question. Um, for the Mbongis, uh, what, what slot do we put them into? Because like each Mbongi has like a different date. Where do you yes. want us to put the ones yes. that you said that we could do for? So, so from if, saying, somebody's about to answer. If you're doing a yes. co-curricular, then you should put it in the co-curricular slot. If you're doing um, an office hours in Bangi, but the, because the videos haven't been posted, then you would have put those lecture videos in those corresponding dates. But since not, um, I would I would just say. Oh, Miss hmm. Carter, you had you had the dates already. Yeah, they're already up. Just how like we had it all semester. Okay. Is set for because of the day, because of the day with time, we're not able to just not go able to just go. So. Everybody, everybody, mute so we don't have any echo. Well, let me let me ask you, Scar. So, framing question five. Uh, I just talked to a couple people right before the call. 
it will be posted today. Would you prefer that they just go in, look at the syllabus for where um, the week's discussions of framing question five are and slot those in boggies in there? Yeah, I think I'll just, I'll just change the date so that people aren't confused. And maybe I'll just put framing question five so that y'all know. Yeah. And then that way um, you could just go ahead and upload them there. But for co-curriculars, like if you did the same COVID video, upload them in the co-curricular spot. So anything that's not a lecture in Bangi should go with the co-curriculars. So, so just to be clear, this is a lecture in Bangi, Ms. Carter, is that what this would be? For yeah. But you Thursday, know, Thursday, okay. Yeah, just to make it easier, I'm going to go ahead and, and change that right now. So it'll say office, um, office hours in Bangi. Ms. Carter. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Last and time. Quick question. The, sorry, the first, sorry, my bad. The first, um, the first office hours, you said to put it under co-curricular. Is that okay for the yeah, like the very first time? Yeah, because we're figuring this thing out. It, see, the thing is, they're not like separate grades, right? So we're it's it's, all gonna be one point, like all the yeah, points are gonna add up. It's all gonna go together. Whether you did a co-curricular, whether you did an office hours in Bangi, yeah. this is just all supplementing the same thing. So it's really not a big deal on where you put them. Um, as long as I have them, but it's just to get easier. Yeah, I'm gonna go yeah. ahead and do that. So I apologize for everybody that's been confused over the past. Thank months. you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. No, 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 no. no. Thank and you. And quick question: How many um co-curriculars can we do? Oh, we we said five previously just to yeah. help supplement, but you know, if if Dr. we said up to five. Still, yeah, like I'm I'm fine. I'm, with five or i mean i don't know how many videos is on st Copa's website there are a lot there are a number oh, of videos there's a lot. And, then, <laughs> and then we uh and then we added the option of looking at i don't know if any of y'all got a chance to look at any of the episodes uh the excellent work of zainab badawi on the bbc the new history of africa she's done which is like 12 13 14 episodes 14 episodes yeah, uh, so, yeah. if you need more than that you should email us on an individual basis. we can figure out where you're you at figure out where you're at Okay, y'all, we got the echo. The same, so, the same Teddy Riley versus yeah. Babyface. Everybody mute. We ain't trying to listen to no remixes. Quick question. No, he did not just go there. <laughs> question. So what happened if I already have uh, almost 25 in bangies? Yeah, then, man, you can no, kick you that, relax, and write your you essay. Should, you should stop at 20. We're not going to give you any more than 20. So if, if you're there, then that's it. But if you want help on your exam, then you should do framing question six. Because if you're already at the 20 and bangies, then we will give you those five points towards okay. your exam. So where do I get the notes to do the framing question six? That's forthcoming. That's what we're doing. Yeah. In fact, um, the PowerPoint for six, I'll post it after the call. Five has been posted. Uh, framing question six, uh, you'll get a draft text. You see there, and I think everybody, if you can see the screen, right there that that paragraph right there in the middle of the screen draft text discussions of framing questions four five and six everything since the midterm in other words will be posted on blackboard on monday i'm working on that finishing up finishing that up this weekend and so you'll have that monday and i'll give everybody more content to cite so you'll have stuff for framing question six you'll have a whole little essay i'm trying to make sure they're not too long but that you have enough so that anybody who left their book for example, in the dorm, or for some reason couldn't retrieve their materials, um, we're really trying to surround y'all with as much support as possible. So you'll have that uh, by Monday. So, Dr. Carr, these final essays are going to be based off of texts used in class. The class lectures uh, that are posted, uh, the books, of course, and the draft text. Yes. Okay. Another question. So. If I made notes for the, uh, I think it was last lecture or two lectures back, I made notes from framing question uh, five. Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you talked about framing question five. So I used some of the notes that you you said to make my essay up. So I already have the essay yeah. book. Oh, well, then you're good. Can I use that, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if you remember, we, you know, we scheduled our weekly uh, we, 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 we changed our weekly in-person synchronous learning exercise, remote teaching basically is what this is. We did this for the office hours, but because there was a lapse between frame question four, uh, I guess that was close to six hours of, of uh, lecture, 
which was posted on black uh, on YouTube because there was a lapse between the two framing questions. Um, we then allowed people to we basically converted this week and last week we converted it the our conversations from office hours to actually having the conversation having the class having a for, a version of the class and so um yes any notes from this week this past tuesday and last week you can yeah those is, those are what you would use to answer framing question five now that was a stopgap measure because now framing question five's lectures uh which uh we recorded now we recorded this this week's section and i went back and started and went all the way through it for two hours that will be posted to uh youtube today and i'll send an email out because everybody who did not come either this week or last week to where we are right now the zoom session will have that available to write their essay from but you took notes from those. So in addition to being able to turn in in bongies, which we also said you could do this week and last week, since we did the framing question, the substantive discussion, in addition to being able to turn in bongies for those, uh, you can use, you should use, in fact, your notes from the class that we did this week and last week on Zoom. And then we recorded that. And now that's going to be posted. That's being posted today for everybody else. So yeah, you're right. You don't have to go back and redo anything. In other words, you've already done it. So thank you. Very, very just to clarify, I'm I'm on Blackboard now. And I'm uploading the Mbangi. So where it says uh, Mbangi for April 7th, 9th, 14th, 16th, and so forth, I'm changing those to frame and question five. So if you already submitted, it's it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to change the date. I, it, I only see like three people submitted it. So maybe like okay. four or five, not that many people. So I'm just going to go ahead and change it. If you already submitted, then that's fine. So right. if if you have submitted an Mbangi in there, you're still going to submit an essay in there? Excuse me? Say that again? If you already have an Mbangi in there, what are you going to do? It, it will still count. I'm still going to count it. You good, brother? Yeah, you're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. This is we, just for everybody who have yet to submit um, the Mbangi. This car is meticulous. She just reorganizing it so to make it easy for y'all. But she, she everything that's been submitted is there. Okay. It's there. And it will be it will count. Yeah, she's just making it easy for folks who, uh, and, and I doubt seriously that's anybody who's on this call. It'll probably be people who are not here right now and will have questions later. And then of course, we're gonna post this video as well. So, uh, and send an email out, say any questions, uh, refer to the first 20 minutes or so of this video and you'll be able to get those questions answered. Let's, let's go, go. Wait a second. Sorry, one last thing. Yes. Dear. Um. Do you have like an idea of when the videos will be out so like I can like plan for that? I couldn't hear you. One more time. Do you have an idea of like when the videos will be out? That's yeah. They uh they told me the the video for framing question five will be posted today. I don't know what time today, but when I get off this uh when we get out of these uh, when we get out of this session at noon, I will check with them before I log into my next meeting. Uh, which starts at noon, but I'll log in. I I'll check with them and see. As soon as I get a time, I'll let you all know, but I expect that it will be done sometime in the day. I, I doubt, I, I mean, this is I mean, pure speculation, but based on uh, their staff and their capacity, I would say it's not gonna be midnight. It'll might be maybe like five, six o'clock in the afternoon, but I'll double check and if I get a specific time, I'll shoot y'all a quick email. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And then I will also share with them, you know, we're all working remotely. So just so you know how it works, when I finish recording this, when we get off this session, even when I, when I log on to the next one, I'm going to convert this video and then put it in a digital Dropbox that they created, their tech people created for me. And then it takes usually about an hour, a little bit less than an hour to load because it's kind of long. Once they get it, then they will send it to the people who put it on YouTube and they'll put it up on YouTube. So th this one will be available too. I won't speculate as to when, but I'm sure it'll be up by, let's see, today is, well, I just said, I'm about to do what I said I wasn't gonna do. I'm gonna send this to them as soon as we get off, <laughs> okay? So frame of question five will be up today. This one will be up shortly and I'll let you know when it's posted as well. 
All right, let's, let's do this because I know some people have to jump off and I want to make sure we get through this review sheet, not only for everyone on the call, but for everyone who will watch it later, which of course, those of you get off can watch it later as well. Um, the review sheet, the, um, the syllabus, in fact, let me pull our syllabus up. There's our content. I want to make sure we'll see what's up co-curriculars this is the blackboard page so you all know they go the some of the embongies co-curriculars a uh, final exam review sheet has been posted and also framing question five has been posted so let me go to yes the three ground rules of intellectual work home for a second give me a second here let me stop sharing long enough to go look for the where is the final exam i'm sorry got it um if you're following along on i need to find the syllabus on my computer um give me a second and then what i'll do is i'll pull this up so everybody can watch look at it together yeah here we go all right let's do it again sorry y'all here we are all right so here is the here's the final exam review sheet and i'm just i just pulled up the syllabus parallel because like if we were in class i would do it so y'all could see the three ground rules of intellectual work is the first question what are the three ground rules of intellectual work and what is the significance of translation and recovery to the work of disciplinary african studies if you look at your syllabus i'd go all the way down beginning on page all right y'all Right. Please. Syllabus glossary begins on page 17, uh, 14, rather, and you see all those definitions there. I would rely heavily on this. Everybody has this. Uh, the ground rules of intellectual work are on page 16. They begin on page 16. You see the footnotes and everything there? Okay, somebody mute. I, I don't want to... If you can hear me, please everyone mute so that... We won't. All right, let me go find out who it is. I guess I got to take a second, y'all. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure everybody can. I think it's Danielle. Hear. What's Danielle? It's Danielle. Okay. Did she just mute? I'm sorry, y'all. This takes me a this takes me a little bit longer because I got to go through the thing. I think oh, she muted. Good. It. Yeah. Cool. All right. Good. Thank you. All right. The only reason I keep it up like this. All right. Yes. So ground rules, you see them there. Page 16. I'm going to go kind of quick and you can go. It goes right up to page 17. So everything is there for you. And we've talked about this stuff so much now. Y'all could answer this quickly. Uh, what is an intellectual genealogy? Do I have that here? Yeah, there it is right there. Intellectual genealogy. How might one go about reconstructing intellectual genealogies? It's all there. What is Wale Shoyenka? Consider the dynamic possessions that human beings uh, in general and Africans in particular must use as commodities of exchange. That is in uh, this book right here uh, of Africa on page VII. In fact, you know, I'm not peculiar to them Roman numerals, VII. All right, there it is right there, see? So y'all can kind of look at that right there when you review the video um, to what is the scholar and novelist Daniel P. Black referring to when he describes the coming in this book. I do not like not being with y'all, but the fact is that we can show this stuff on video now. That's his epigraph, his framing, um, his framing kind of uh, dedication, dedicated to the children there. Uh, and of course he starts the book with the great Sonia Sanchez, our great poet. It was the coming that was bad. You know, he's referring to enslavement. You see the ship there in the coming as well. In fact, let me let me turn on this. Uh, give me a second. Turn on this backlight a little bit. This gives me a little bit more light to work with. Okay. Um, what is the role of migration in human history? We know it's the central theme in human history. And how, according to Ayikwe Arma, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm looking for my copy of Arma's book, and I don't see it immediately so give me about give me another 15 seconds let me go get my working copy which is fortunately in this room should be right behind me uh no i moved it okay well we're going to work we're going to work without our ma for a minute 
because it might take me longer than it's worth. Well, give me give me a second here because I want to make sure I have all the books with me. So we can, anybody has any questions related to the books, we can answer them. Okay, here we go. Here's a copy. All right. Uh, did, 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 where am I? What is the role of migration in human history? We know it's the central theme. And how, according to Ayikwe Arma and the eloquence of the scribes, do traditions of migration frame the long view genealogy of Africana intellectual work? Uh, that's chapter 12, page 185, Traditions of Migration. You see it there, page 185. Let's go to page 185 just for a split second. Traditions of Migration. You see it there? That's the beginning of that chapter. My notes are all written in here. This is one of my working copies. What text is that? Uh, this is the Eloquence of the Scribes. This is Ayikwe Arma's book, Professor Arma. Um, Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, very quickly, first paragraph, if oral traditions were the only background material upon which African literature could draw, the field would still be vast. However, the oral epics themselves, whether they come from South, East, West, or Central Africa, point to older sources. One of them, by nature transitional, is the corpus of oral narratives describing, sometimes very briefly, a series of population movements from the Nile Valley. Partly because this corpus is archaic and partly because as social memory, it was not necessarily attached to specific rural houses interested in its conversation, it is relatively unstable. Our discussions of traditions of migration will be brief, necessarily so. Populations on the move, under pressure, have little time for the production of literature. Mass migrants are more like refugees than ordinary travelers. Then he goes on to talk about the nature of migration and how people remember migration. It's really the source for, and one of the sources for movement and memory, that conceptual category. And so he goes on to talk about where people moved in Africa, how people moved in Africa, and going back to the review sheet, when I asked the question, what is the role of migration in human history? People move, that's how they begin to know themselves through movement. And according to him, traditions of migration do frame that long view genealogy when you go back to recover them. So he's talking about retracing migrations. That's why he's talking about it in that chapter, chapter 12. Ngugi, what according to Ngugi Wathiango in this book, uh, this is something torn and new. What, uh, according to Ngugi, are linguicide and lingua fam? That's going to be in this book in chapter one. The, 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 the uh, boy, let me see, let me get this light right, y'all. There we go. You see the traditions, chapter one, when he talks about the dismembering practices, planning European memory in Africa. So he talks about dismemberment and remembering here. And let me see if I can find it quickly. If I can't, I'm gonna move very, uh, move kind of a little bit more briskly. Ah, here we go. Page 17, when he talks about language, Africans in the diaspora and on the continent were soon to be re the recipients of this linguistic logic of conquest. He's talking about how they try to take people's language from them with two results, linguicide in the case of the diaspora and linguistic famine or lingua fam on the continent. Linguicide is the linguistic equivalent of genocide. Genocide involves conscious acts of physical massacre. Linguicide, conscious acts of language liquidation. Linguicide, writes Skutnab Kanga, quote, implies that there are agents involved in causing the death of languages. This is precisely the fate of African languages in the diaspora. The encounter between African languages, Yoruba, Igbo, Twi, Kikongo, and many others, and Western languages, French, Spanish, Dutch, Portuguese, English, was perhaps the most subtle and most complex plex aspect of the cultural confrontation that the African slaves faced in the new world. Page 17, uh, something torn and new. What according to Ngugi is the major difference between the continental African and the diasporic African as it relates to how each group relates to the crypt? His crypt metaphor is from chapter two, remembering visions. That's where he talks about this metaphor of the crypt, so to speak. So the whole idea that uh, black languages have been encased almost like corpses. You see it there, he begins talking about it here on page 43, given, gives the example of the, uh, of the Irish there. And then he talks about the fact that the 
uh, here, here actually is the story on page 50. I know we're doing review, but by walking this through, I also get a chance to show y'all some of the text. Let me read it from, from it very quickly. We never get a chance to do this in class because it usually we are, we're under that a little bit more of a time constraint. It says, one cannot say the name of dwellers in the European master's linguistic mansion. They are the elite cut off from the social body. Sent by the community to get knowledge from the wider world, they rarely return, and when they do, it is as strangers. Chinua Achebe, an arrow of God, tells the story of Oduche, who is sent to the new school by Ezulu, the chief priest of his own people, with the specific mission to find out what is there, and if it is good, bring him his share. However, Oduche learns enough to make him feel sufficiently bold to come back home and imprison a sacred python. He would have killed it, but instead traps it in a box. Oduche's story is that of all other graduates of the prison house of European languages. He captures the python, the symbol of his people's being, and imprisons it in a box to suffocate and possibly die. I always remember how upon learning how to read in English, my classmates and I would carry the, the English language Bible to church. The, ser the service was to entirely in Gikuyu. Everybody else had the Gikuyu language Bible. The preacher read passages from the Gikuyu language Bible, but we who had been to school would follow him through our English text. The Gikuyu voice had come to us in English sounds. He's talking there, this idea of the crypt. He's saying that the crypt is the place where the, the sacred kind of in, in, in the metaphor from Arrow of God, the sacred, sacred python is the thing that keeps the people alive. That student who had been to the European education takes that python and entombs it, entombs it in the European place, in the crypt. And so as a result, what you see here is the major difference between the continental African and the diasporic African as it relates to how each group relates to the crypt. The continental African still has access to those languages, to those cultures, to those traditions, at least theoretically. We know these things change. Now you see these things being erased a number of places and you have to be very deliberate when you try to keep them. But as we talk about in class, many of you who are continental Africans or the children directly of continental Africans, you can understand or speak the languages that predate European languages. But those in the diaspora have had those languages cut off from their original root and remixed into the various ebonics of the Western Hemisphere or of the diaspora generally. So the crypt for the African in the diaspora is one that is far more remote. So what he talks about in this chapter is how the Africans of the diaspora are considered almost like corpses. They've been cut off from the language, but then he says, the corpses begin to speak. And what does that mean? We begin in the diaspora to recover using our cultural memory and using very deliberate acts of writing and storytelling and narrative to create these identities that are grounded in the African experience, but then describe the diasporic struggle and diasporic experience. And that's where he talks about Toni Morrison, Paul Dunbar. He talks about any number of people writing. So think about that in, in terms of that relationship to the crib. Let's go to the next one. We're only on page one. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. How, according to our ma, back to the eloquence of the scribes, does the eloquence of the scribes serve as the source for the dance of inspiration? Just going to point you to the sources there. Chapter 19, chapter 17 is the eloquence of the scribes. Chapter 19 is the uh, dance of inspiration. In a sentence, let me see if I have it over here. I might have dance of inspiration. I might. Oh, yeah. Look at that. On page 15, look in your text. See, we try to set y'all up for success. Set you up for success. That is right there. Dance of inspiration, the active process of engaging memory as the venue of inspiration. This process which results in what Ayikwe Arma has called the dance of uh, the embrace of memory as resource is triggered by human initiative that is fed in turn by a search in the vast storehouse of information constituted by the accumulated knowledge and values of all the ancestors who have ever thought, dreamed, aspired, acted, achieved, and died, leaving traces of their passage here. Now we know that human experience can't be reduced to an archive. Our archive is just a little fraction, but what our mind is saying is there's enough in African memory to tap into. And once you tap into it, you use it as a resource to begin to engage in creative work or what he would call the dance of inspiration. All right, this is gonna be very helpful for folks who missed 
this morning. And even for you as you go back and review. All right, the six conceptual categories, no need to go through that. We've done that ad, uh, ad nauseum, I suppose some people might say. There they are, just for folks who are looking at your syllabus. You see them there. Be prepared to answer questions requiring you to know both the categories and how to apply them. So there they are. What are the six framing questions? All right, right underneath those categories we have Starting on page nine of the syllabus, the six framing questions. How do we undertake the study of African experiences? Right, number one. Number two, how do Africans preserve and affirm their ways of life and use their identities as a means to resist enslavement? Number three, what are some of the similarities and differences in practices of self-determination of Africans in the United States and their counterparts throughout the hemisphere? Number four, how did Africans begin to conceptualize unity and thought and action beyond national boundaries in the face of European and American imperialism? Number five, and this video will be posted today, those lectures uh, that we talked about and we our conversation on Zoom earlier in the week. How did Africans make sense of and participate in international developments? Number six, you can do the by with the essay, just housekeeping. Uh, this will be in addition to, it's not required. What organizations, ideologies, and leaders did Africans create and engage in the 20th century to promote and advance their liberation? Those are the six conceptual categories. Be prepared, I'm sorry, the six framing questions. Be prepared to provide a sh short answers to all framing questions, one through six, but with specific longer emphasis on framing questions four, five, and six. If you jumped on before, after the first 20 minutes, uh, you have now the review sheet. That's what I'm reading from. At the beginning of it, it, it tells you the format for the remixed final exam. It's going to be uh, two parts, one essay, which is 80% of the grade, and then 20 short answer uh, questions, 20 multiple choice questions that will be administered on Blackboard. All that's going to happen on uh, next Thursday. And um, most of what we're talking about on this review sheet is drawn from framing questions four, five, and six, and you'll get draft text copy to help you uh, answer uh, the uh, essay questions on Monday. Although the essays themselves, the essay questions will be posted tomorrow and sent to you. So you'll have from Friday tomorrow until next Thursday, 1159, to answer the two essay questions, 40% apiece. And then on Thursday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Blackboard will be open for you to take the multiple choice part of the exam. We're setting y'all up for success. And we, by this, this review is pretty, uh, pretty detailed to go over the entire semester, particularly everything since the midterm and, and the Rona kind of changed the, our way of life for a minute. Uh, so you'll have everything you need. Let's continue. Why did Wale Shayinka refer to Africa? Come on, son. Where is my, of Africa? I had, oh, here it is. Why did Wale Shienka refer to Africa as the human hatchery for labor in modern history? You see that in framing question four's PowerPoint. I talked about it a lot. Remember in Of Africa, his book of Africa. So Yenka divides his book into part one and part two. He talks about the human hatchery at the beginning uh, of part, uh, but the preface actually, there's the preface. You can read that for yourself. If you pause the video when you have the video, come on, son. There you go. And you can talk about the human hatchery there for labor in modern history. In the coming, in Dr. Black's book, what was the distinction between the role of healers in African and European societies, according to the author? And of course, Black in the coming refers to healers. He talks about the holistic view of healing in Africana societies. So it isn't just about diagnosing and treating disease. It's about uh, ministering to the whole person, being with the whole person, being in community. And y'all can read that for yourself. What are first order and second order religions and or languages and how did Africans make use of each to attempt to acquire political power during the period of African anti-colonial and U.S. and Caribbean civil rights or anti-colonial movements? First order and second order religions or knowledge traditions are not in any of the books. That is from our uh, class conversations, and I did not put that in the glossary. A first order culture tradition, as we talked about, are things that people create out of their culture. A second order uh, religion and or language and or cultural tradition is a tradition that people inherit from other people and then they make their own. And so that's, uh, you know, so for example, if you take Kwame Nkrumah, Martin Luther King, if you take Nanny Queen of Maroons in Jamaica, they are using variations on the English language or different ebonic forms to advance their interests. That's a second order language. 
English was not their first language, their ancestors' first languages, but they take those languages and remix them for their own benefit. A first order tradition would be more like Yasantiwa, as we talked about uh, in framing question five, Yasantiwa of the Akan people, uh, the Ashantis near Kumasi, uh, Ejiso, her hometown, resisting the British, but she's using her language, her culture, her po political formation, her governance structure to resist. That's a first order tradition. She didn't inherit that from another group of people. It came from her, it came from them. Okay, uh, what is settler colonialism? What role did it play in the creation of contemporary uh, political boundaries? Okay, this is the problem when you at your house. I was just reading a book on, a new book on American settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is basically when the European powers came and took, pe took people's land. In Africa, it was Africans, but in the Western Hemisphere, of course, it was the Native Americans. That's why we say slavery, enslavement isn't the original sin of the Western Hemisphere or the United States. The original sin is dispossessing people of their land, settler colonialism. What role did it play in the creation of contemporary African state boundaries and political identities? As Ngugi says in chapter one of something torn and new, every line on that map got drawn by people who came out of Western Eurasia and those artificial lines, which cause a lot of conflict now. You know, I'm not sure y'all saw Trump talking about he's gonna close the border and, and deny anybody immigration. And he's working on green cards with that little white supremacist, Stephen Miller, who's I'm sure in the middle of it in the White House with glee. Um, well, yeah, that's because you got an imaginary lines on continents. And of course, y'all be careful, those of you in Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, these Southern Confederacy governors now saying they're gonna reopen their states. Well, those imaginary, those are lines that are imaginary between South Carolina and Georgia, between North and South Carolina, between Virginia and North Carolina. And if people are going across those imaginary lines, which we call state borders, you know, there's no natural line there. There's only state troopers or whoever's gonna try to keep you out of the state. So if you're in Georgia and go to the nail salon or the barbershop and then get in your car and decide you're going to drive to Alabama or drive to Tennessee, there may be some state troopers. Well, those are still Confederate states. So, yeah, maybe you go into Kentucky where they got a little bit more sane governor and say, now, y'all can't come in this state because we don't know if you have been isolated. In other words, those artificial lines become important because they become markers for political relationships, political uh, for polities, for political structures. All right. Why does Soyenka refer to Africans as the children of Herodotus? That's in part one. Herodotus is the so-called father of history, which of course he isn't, but that's in chapter one of something, I'm sorry, of, of Africa. Uh, according to our Ma, what are the sources of his intellectual and cultural traditions? And how do European style education and colonial literature serve as an anesthesia to attempt to negate them? That is in the first eight chapters of this book, The Eloquence of the Scribes, he talks about his journey and he talks about, in fact, chapter three, colonial literature as anesthesia. He said, they gave me all this Shakespeare and stuff and basically told me, forget whatever you learned in the village or wherever you learned about Africa, Shakespeare is the best there ever was. And so it, it, it forms almost, it almost serves as an anesthesia. It puts you to sleep. In other words, it just makes you forget the other things that you've had in your background, chiefly your culture. So that's what he's talking about. Um, also, according to our Ma, what is the relationship of oral to written literacies, both in human culture and African culture? We touched on that a little bit a minute ago, but we all human beings communicate. And we, of course, our first communications are oral. And then as we begin to inscribe or write things, paint things, draw things, ultimately create languages that we can pass on, meta nature, the, uh, the hieroglyphs meaning a form but also uh, using symbols for sounds. That's what we have now, these 26 characters of the alphabet, so to speak. They don't mean anything in terms of the, the picture. They are representative of sounds. Well, they're all literacies. People talk about literacy meaning being able to write, but no, literacy is being able to decode something that's been encoded in a language. And so people say, well, Africans are oral and Europeans are written, no everybody's oral at the beginning and most people find a way to inscribe and that inscription may not look like 26 characters in the alphabet for symbols for sounds it might look like picture you say that's picture writing it's all picture writing fool are you looking at it with your eyes yeah then it's picture writing are you reading it with your fingers like braille yes then that's an inscription system so the 
relationship of oral written literacies is the same, generally speaking, in human cultures. It only begins to distinguish itself based on the particular cultural techniques of the group we're looking at. The problem finally comes in when we begin to say, if you don't do it the way we do it, yours is inferior to, to ours. And that's where the problem comes in. Some people might call that cultural imperialism, for example. Doesn't mean that things aren't better and worse, but it does mean that if we're gonna judge what we think is more effective or better or more beautiful or whatever, we should have a common set of uh, definitions. We should have a common frame of reference. And often we don't have a common frame of reference. Let's keep going. Ngugi, according to Ngugi, what are the two stages of dismemberment of Africa? We know that from the very, in chapter one of something torn and new, he says the dismemberment of Africa took place in two stages. The first stage, of course, was the physical separation of Africans from Africa. And then the second stage, which continues, is the separation of African memory from African people. I was looking for the exact quote, but it's here. And it's also in the PowerPoint. This is very early on. It's like frame question one. No, frame question two. Actually, no, frame question one. Let's keep going. Um, in chapter one of Something Torn and New, what European ethnic national group does Ngugi describe as the first English colony? and using as an example of white on white dismemberment. He uses Ireland, uh, according, because they tried to suppress the Irish uh, language, well, Erin, uh, the, uh, yeah, the language of the people of Ireland, Erin. Um, according to Ngugi, what is the oldest and best known story of dismemberment and remembering from classical African mythology? That is in chapter two, Remembering Visions. In the beginning of chapter two, he takes us to the story uh, in ancient Egypt, the Egyptian story of Wasir, and Aset and Asar, the story of Isis, Osiris, and Horus. There it is, beginning in chapter two, something torn and new, page 33. All right, let's keep going. What is the cop, cop concept of Marunaj or Marunage? There we go. Now we're in Black movements in America, the concept of Maroonage. How does it distinguish the governance structure, conceptual category from the social structure category? I don't think I put Maroonage in here either because it's all in the books. Yeah, no, having Bongi, not Maroonage. Maroonage, you really see him take Maroonage up um, here in beginning on page 11 in chapter one, Maroonage in North America. You see it there? Maroonage in North America. He's talking about Maroon, of course, from Cimarrones, meaning uh, wild. You see him continue there on page 12. He's going through the concepts of Maroonage, the Africans who are resisting, like the Spanish. That's why when we talk about a 1619 project and 1619 marking the first slaves brought to America. No, no. The Africans who came under duress, the first Africans came almost a century before that because they had been captives of the Spanish. And the Spanish, when they got to Florida, the Africans uh, fought, resisted, ran away, combined with the Native Americans. And that was the first wave of African resistance to Europeans in the North American continent. They partnered with, with the Native Americans. And that's where you get the term uh, Cimarrones or Marron, or now we say maroons, meaning what? Wild. I mean, in other words, they're trying to say, oh, wow, y'all like these wild animals that we can't, can't be tamed. And the Africans is like, whatever, we don't understand what you're saying. We just trying to kill you and get away. So that is where you see the root of what we now call maroons. And so the concept of maroonage or marinage is the idea of self-determination. I will not be oppressed by you. I will not be subjected to you. And if I can't go back to where I'm from, I will create here something that I control, that I could be proud of, that I can raise my family and my generations in, that is not based in your worldview, your ways of knowing, your movement and memory, your cultural meaning making, which is why in our six conceptual categories, the social structure asks the question, who are Africans to other people? The governance structure asks the question, who are Africans to each other? By governance, we're really thinking along the lines of marunage, maroonage, which is why all the other categories feed that second category. So the Marinage structure, the governance structure, 
ask the questions, what science and technology did the Africans create and develop or inherit and retool to advance their interests? The ways of knowing category, what ways of viewing the world are they grounded in, did they use? The movement and memory category, how do they remember these moments and pass them on to future generations? And the cultural meaning making category, what music, art, dance, inscription systems they create in that moment to mark their time on the earth. All of those categories feed the concept of marinage to be distinguished from the social structures they find themselves in. So let's go to the next one. What was the role of improved systems of communications in Africans attempt to practice diaspora as a part of an oppositional African world during the late 19th, mid 20th centuries? Now we're in framing question four. In fact, I thought, yeah, look at that. I was moving some books around the other day and I got a couple of copies of this. This is the paperback copy. This is actually where um, I think about this concept of diaspora. The concept of diaspora, actually, I kind of um, used a gloss from this brother who's at Columbia now. He used to be at Rutgers. I think he was at Rutgers when he wrote this book. It's Brent Hayes Edwards' book, The Practice of Diaspora. It's purple. So can, can y'all see that title? You see that Practice of Diaspora? Edwards is really writing about, among other places, uh, New York and Paris in the 1920s. He's writing about Langston Hughes, Rene Moran, Claude McKay, Paulette Nardal, Elaine Lott, W.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, a number of different people. In fact, I was just, these are, this is Elaine Locke's lectures he gave in Carnegie, where Office of Undergraduate Studies is. He gave these talks in 1916. Y'all can believe that. But the idea then of improved systems of communication means in the late 19th, early 20th century, Africans were moving around the world because the transportation had gotten better. Then you have telegraph, then you have recordings, then you have a bunch of the telephones, newspapers, then eventually, of course, radio, television. This is a book, for example, Racial Migration. These are Africans who came out of the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Cuba, United, to the United States. And so you see these Africans in the United States, they become black people. But where they're from, there's a much more complex version of African. And he's talking, Africana, and he's talking about what happened in New York City. So that framing, so that review question, what is the role of improved systems of communications? They begin to practice diaspora. In other words, they begin to see each other as connected, even as they're different from each other, they are still connected during that period. Pan identities comes out of that. We talked about that on Tuesday, thought I saw it. Yeah, remember we talked about this very briefly, my man Hakeem Adi's book, Pan-Africanism. Pan means all. All Africanism, meaning what? Africans see themselves as belonging to a much larger group, a global group called African people. Those emerge uh, among both African people and non-Africans because you see that uh, there's a notion of pan-Germanism. There's a notion of pan-Westernism. People talk about Western civilization. That's a pan concept. The English are not the French are not the Americans. None of them are the Germans. None of them are the Italians or the Spanish. But together, they would say Western civilization. Well, what does that mean? That's a pan. That's an that's a all movement. All right. And that kind of emerges very heavily in the mid to late 19th centuries. What, according to Yinka, is the social reality across African populations? Sorry, Brent. I'll talk to you another day, brother. Um, what did I do with, uh, OK. What, according to Soyinka, is the social reality across African populations that generates a feeling of hopelessness and impotence? Page 93 of, of Africa. We're going to keep it moving, but I will move to the page and let y'all read it for yourself. We talked about that on Tuesday, and it's also in the PowerPoint for framing question five. Yes. I thought some nice Energy. All right, here we go. What for a ma is the relationship of writing to the work of social revolution? Remember, Ayikwe Arma wanted to be. Uh, a revolutionary, like a gun shooting, organizing revolutionary. He failed at that because he couldn't find a place to really practice that. And in chapter seven, Failure and Focus, he writes about the fact that he turned to writing as a form of resistance, as a form of revolutionary act, not because it was his first choice, but because he wanted to do something to pass it on. And many decades later, as he sits in Popenguin, Senegal in his mid eighties, he continues to do that work. All right, let's continue. Um, according to our mind, what are the four basic periods for African literature? If I could find them quickly, I would give them to you from the book, but I probably won't be able to find them quickly. Oh, I think it's in the migrations piece. Let me, give me a second. If I can find it. Oh yeah, here we go. 
Look at that. Had it marked. Page 145. You see it there? Page 145. Those are the four areas. Y'all can look them up yourselves. All right, let's continue. What according yeah, y'all can look them up yourself. What according to Cedric Robinson was the role of land in the thwarting of the promise of the American Revolution? Let's go over here to the pages 96 and 97. Remember chapter five of Black Movements in America? You see chapter five, he's talking about how the failure to yeah, give I people land speaks to how the two cultures emerge, the two oppositional cultures. Here's the next page where he writes about what that mm -hmm. does. Y'all can look that up for yourselves. You can pause the video when it's loaded. And here, he then talks about how these two cultures emerge in the Africana community. One that is kind of grounded in marinage, the other is grounded in kind of notions of assimilation. Very important. All right, let's continue. Uh, and that's also the next one. What groups cons constituted the variegated American labor that America accumulated as its negations in the late 19th and early 20th century? In fact, I'll just pause here, go to back to chapter five and read it for you very quickly. One time, not going to pause. In the long, violent and increasingly oppressive era that followed the Civil War and the failed reconstruction, land, or more particularly the appropriation of land, marred, thwarted and maimed the promise of a democratic American social contract. The land taken from the Native American, the land refused to former slaves and the poor whites, the land withheld from the poor immigrants from Asia, Europe, and Central America formed the politics of the Republic into a stark social war between the super rich and the grubbing poor. Sounds like a little conflict going on in somebody's house right now. This horrid contest between the few and the many was made even more reprehensible in the general opinion because of its contrast with the democratic rhetoric of the founding fathers. He goes on. That's that variegated or differentiated from each other labor force that comes together and has the negation of capitalism or these kind of hyper-capitalist movements in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They're not the same as each other, but they have a common interest because they're being pressed down in the class structure. Um, those of you who might be doing an embongi for today, think about that in the context that is the period, here's the current event. Everybody, all these people are filing for uh, unemployment, dozens of millions of people in the United States millions of people worldwide. When you lose your job and you can't pay your rent, eventually that means the landlord is not going to get her rent. If you can't pay your mortgage, that means the banker is not going to get his money. And ultimately what you're going to see is that all these different people who are different from each other culturally, different from each other in terms of their traditions or however you want to define it, they share one thing. They are part of labor and they are landless or they are pressed down in the structure in a way that where they share in common, they don't have resources. Ultimately, if enough of those people are, are, are find themselves in desperate circumstances, it's going to force those people who are profiting from them, who have profited from them, Jeff Bezos, multi-billionaire, the people working in the Amazon warehouse don't even have PPE. Guess what? If enough of those people take a L, his empire is going to crumble because not only are people not going to have money to buy that stuff off Amazon, those people are going to stop working and nobody's going to come work. And the next thing you know, they're like, you know what? I've been packing these boxes. Let me take a couple of them home because I got to eat. And the next thing you know, the revolutionary kind of thrust is made possible because that in itself is not a revolution in, in the kind of political sense that people move against each other in terms of classes. The revolutionary dimension would be if people made deliberate action to make a better world as a result of their conditions. But that, that all starts with that notion in Robinson introduces in, in another, you know, we talked about this in class, but this would be like a materialist reading of history, looking at material forces. It's really about the dispossession of resources. And in a society like the United States, in a capitalist society, it is the possession of the means of production. It's the possession of land, which allows you to build this kind of a system. So, and that answers the second one. What are the two alternative black political cultures described by Cedric Robinson? Page 97 of Black Movements in America. Which one gravitated toward, gravitated toward integration? These were the black elites who began to define liberation, who began to define freedom in the context of language and ideas they had learned by studying with, alongside, uh, or separate from, but in a same conceptual universe with the kind of oppressors, the Europeans. 
which gravitated towards separation. Well, those are the people, uh, the marinage spirit, the governance structure spirit, the idea that yes, we are resisting and we're also self-determining for ourselves, our culture. And that's what he says of the two alternative political cultures that he describes on page 97 of Black Movements in America and in every book just about he ever wrote, really with a highlight being Black Marxism. Uh, Black Marxism. Yeah, while we're here, since we're being recorded, might as well show y'all, um, Remember, I always show y'all the cover of this when we're on the PowerPoint, and I can show you the book itself. This is the tribute book to Cedric Robinson from Race and Class that talks about his work. And I just like doing that right now for 15 seconds because that's the brother himself, a great brother. Um, fortunately, got a chance to tell him that before he made transition. He's been gone now for a few years, the great Cedric J. Robinson. All right, let's continue. Um, what was the role of Afro-Christianity in the social and political struggle of Africans in the United States? from the era of reconstruction to the civil rights movement era. He talks about that in here. He says Afro-Christianity, he would define Afro-Christianity as being part of that Marunage tradition, kind of a communal tradition. Think the civil rights movement. Think the idea, in fact, I'll read you here. He says on page 97, inventive. No, he says to the contrary. The black mass movements of the late 19th and 20th centuries proved both the existence and vitality of an alternative black political culture, emergent from the brutal rural regimes of slavery and later peonage, inventive rather than imitative. In other words, they were inventive. They didn't imitate the Europeans. Communitarian rather than individualistic. So it isn't about the first black to do this, the first black to do that. No, we're all gonna get put on. He goes on, democratic rather than Republican, meaning we're all gonna participate. It's not gonna be you representing us somewhere. Afro-Christian rather than secular and materialist, meaning that there's this notion that there's a God, there's a creative spirit, that way of knowing very heavily infused this notion of spirituality. You separate that from a way of knowing that is more secular. And as we were saying earlier, materialist. Well, this ain't about God, there ain't no God. This is about capital. It's like me and now, uh, this is not how the Afro-Christian view looks. He says, or for that matter, the Afro-Muslim, the Afro-Jewish, uh, or really to keep it but the Africana spiritual traditions which inform all of those traditions. So Yoruba, the, Ifa, the Odo Ifa, I mean, all those traditions which Africans had before and then express themselves in Vodun, Karomble, Santeria, Makumba, so forth. He says, the social values of these largely agrarian people, these are largely, they're not really urban people yet, generated a political culture that distinguished between the inferior world of the political and the transcendent universe of moral goods. Separatism was the principal impulse of this culture, not alone, but mostly. And over the next century or more, this separatism would assume the several forms already familiar. Then he goes through the different labels, marunage, Immigration with an E, meaning what? Just leave. Migration, central theme in human history. And the domestic or external colonization. Although it foreclosed the possibility of integration or assimilation, separatism in its most sanguine manifestations accommodated the possibility of social coexistence, avoiding the moral squalor of black racism. Meaning what? Howard University is a great example. Howard University rejects the idea of black superiority, like the oh, white devil, no, 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 no. But Howard University operates as a historically black college, meaning what? In many ways, it's like a maroon community. It's not exclusively black. It would never be exclusively black. By law, it couldn't be from 1867, but it has a critical mass of black people, many of whom choose it because it is predominantly black. And just like the rest of the HBCUs who are not exclusively black either, but in the HBCU space, the grounding is the kind of maroonage, is the self-determination. So yes, this is a black space that welcomes in everybody else, but it is a black space that welcomes in everybody else. So going back, well, we never left the review sheet. What is the role of Afro-Christianity in the social and political struggle of Africans in the United States from the era of Reconstruction to the Civil Rights Movement era? Afro-Christianity connects to his notion, Robinson's notion of a spiritual kind of anchor that informs these Africana ways of knowing. And, you know, you go to chapel every Sunday at Howard. I mean, why is that? Everybody's not a Christian. It really ain't about Christianity. When he says Christianity, don't think strictly Christ. Think notions of spirituality. What dates could be usefully described, be described as the long 20th century? Look at that. That should be an S. All right, this is a 
This is not, yeah, it's a word document. Dr. Clark, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, th these questions you're going over, and this just for the multiple choice section, or these questions we're supposed to be answering in our essay? This for the entire the entire essay. That's why I'm taking my time. So you can use okay. this to help answer uh, your the essay question. I would assume that you're going to use this in the um, in the proportion that's outlined. In other words, what am I saying? Let me not, let me let me make this simple. I'm assuming you're going to use it and apply it wherever you need to to mm -hmm. answer both the essay questions and to answer the multiple choice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, and absolutely, absolutely, Virgil. Um, what Excuse did... me. Yes. I'm sorry, Dr. Carr. Um, I just wanted to know, like, um, when would you be sending out um, this recording and last um, class recording? Like, should we expect it okay, by yeah. the weekend? Yeah. Like, is it gonna be emailed or is it gonna be uploaded? I will, um, I'll reiterate that near the end, and there's probably a lot of people who came on after we started. In the first 20 minutes, I went over all this, but let me do it again. Thank you, because I'm sure there's some other people who came on since um, since we started. Framing question five, the recording will be uploaded today. I heard from the Sankofa folks this morning. Um, this one, as soon as we get off, before I go to my next meeting, I'm going to... Uh, Send, put it in the Dropbox. It usually takes about an hour to send to them. Then they send it to their people who upload. So I don't know when this recording, what we're on right now, will be uploaded, but I anticipate it will be sometime between today and tomorrow because I'm going to send it to them, uh, my hip hop class at 3.40. By then they will have it. So, uh, and then I will text them and ask them to get it up ASAP. They're putting up five today. They said it will be available today. But um, in fact, this one might be available today too. I'm just, I just don't know. Cause you know, everybody's working with a skeleton crew now as the Rona yeah. makes its rounds. So, but yes, thank you. And, and there's some other people on the call, I'm sure who weren't here in the first 20 minutes who didn't hear that. So I appreciate you saying that, uh, asking me. Um, in you. fact, let me, I'm, I appreciate y'all. Cause that, that gives me a chance to kind of, we're on page three of eight and I don't want to go a little bit, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker so I can get everybody done. The long 20th century, this is stuff we talked about in framing question five. That means we're going to begin the long 20th century with the kind of expansion of America's imperial interests in the 1890s and in the long 20th century at the end of the 20th century, 2000, 2001. The American century, we use the date that many people, Nikhil Singh, I was actually looking at Nikhil Singh's latest book over here a minute ago. I keep rearing back like I could find it, but you know, tell him, oh, look at that. This is not the book. Well, I'll give you the citation anyway. It's Nikhil Singh's book, more recent book, Race and America's Long War. So they enter this thing, man, about this short. He actually takes this up through Donald Trump. This is a more recent book. But at any rate, Singh is the one who, well, he's one of the many who talk about this notion of the American century and the long century, long civil rights movement, long black freedom struggle, long 20th century. When you see the word long in those categories, what that adjective is doing is describing the fact that if you say the civil rights movement is 1955 to 1965, but then you say, but Rosa Parks was raising money, she and her husband, Raymond, for the uh, Scottsboro Boys in the 1930s. That's not the 1950s. Then people say, okay, well, that's part of the long civil rights movement. In other words, we're gonna go past the, the date you usually think about. But the American century is a bit of a misleading term because what, what they're saying is after World War II is when the United States emerges as a real global power, so to speak. That's 1945 or so. Then the American century is going to end for some people when you have the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001, because now you've got other powers that are not Russia, that are not China, that are not the United States, who through the use of uh, strategic warfare, uh, terrorism, international terrorism as distinct from domestic terrorism, like the Ku Klux Klan or Timothy McVeigh or others, but the idea is that once that happens, the Americans can't control everything. And so you see then that, that kind of, uh, another thing you might see economic dimensions of that. For example, I know y'all been following the news past few days, past week or two. You see the oil prices that have been plummeting are now negative, meaning you've got oil producers who are trying to slow their capacity to produce because they don't have nowhere to put the oil. So they're literally like trying to figure out ways to force people to take the oil and so, the, the gas prices crater, and in part because the gas is just sitting in, in the ground because ain't nobody driving or very few people are driving, fewer people are driving. Well, 
that becomes a form of economic uh, pressure, economic duress. And so the American century ends when America can't control its beyond, people beyond its borders like it used to be able to do. So what was the nadir and what Howard University professor coined the term? I got all the Rayford Logan books around here and I'm not gonna get up to get any. Nadir means the dark point. Did I put nadir in the glasses? No. Nadir means the dark point, the low point in uh, African experience in the United States. Howard University professor Rayford, R-A-Y-F-O-R-D, Whittingham, W-I-T-T-I-N-G-H-A-M, Logan, Rayford Whittingham Logan, coined that term, professor of history. In fact, uh, John Ho Franklin was so impressed with and influenced by Rayford Logan that he gave that middle name to his son, John Franklin. Uh, good brother, very good brother, scholar who still works with the Smithsonian Institution, very important brother. But the W in John uh, Franklin's son's name is for Whittingham, Wayford Whittingham Logan, who coined the term the nadir. Um, what, according to Ngugi, was the importance of Garveyism and Pan-Africanism as remembering visions and practices? That is going to take us again to something torn and new, chapter three. Chapter three. He's gonna talk about this question of memory, restoration, and African Renaissance, but he also talks about Garvey in chapter two, remembering visions. He says Garveyism was a remembering vision. In fact, since we're here, just to drive the point home, y'all let me walk out of the frame over here, because you see the bookshelf there that y'all can see. There are about a dozen other bookshelves here that look just like that. And on one of them, I'll bring you one of the volumes. This is volume. 11 of 14 volumes of the Marcus Garvey papers. Now see how thick that book is? This book right here, volume 11 has 845 pages. Little, little print. I mean, it's, that's one of the little print pages, right? Little print pages. But the Garvey papers chronicle how Garvey had an international movement. In fact, I'll show you the picture, we'll keep going. See that logo there? These are Africans all over the world working for Africa, right? That's the symbol. So according to Ayikwe Arma, I'm sorry, according to Ngugi, Garveyism and Pan-Africanism is the idea that Africans all over the world should be unified. As Marcus Garvey would say, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. Where in the world did they have their most visible results? Probably the United States, ironically. Garvey's from Jamaica organized primarily out of the United States before he went into exile. They put him out of the United States. He left in 1927. He died in England. He's buried, however, in Jamaica, in his native Jamaica, where he's a national hero. But the most visible result, probably the United States. And you can go to your, we didn't put the map book in yet, did we? Where's the map book? Uh, I should slow down and look for it, but I won't take much more time because I don't know what I did with the map book, yeah. Anyway, in the map book, you have a map, I should keep looking. In the map book, you have, um, a, 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 he, they do a drawing of the Garvey, the Garvey chapters and kind of looking, huh. I was doing something else the other day since we met on Tuesday and I must have taken the book somewhere else in the house slash library. And that's too bad. Anyway, in the map book, there is a map of the UNIA chapters, and you all can look that up for yourselves. Oh, gee. What, according to Arma, is the detriment of African writers not using African languages when writing African literature? That's in chapter 17, which begins on page 241, and that is the one that carries the title of the book, The Eloquence of the Scribes. He's saying you should use your languages when you're writing about yourself. Why is Arma and Ngugi believes that too? Why isn't Armand unconcerned with time and speed when discussing how long it might take to envision a better society as we speed through this? Armand's thing is, study requires time. Telling stories requires listening and thinking and requires time. And whatever you don't complete, others will complete, either while you're alive or the people who come after you. And if we do this right, when you do it well, it will endure. So don't worry about time. Don't worry about speed. And that's and, and and sadly, I think for me, when I think of y'all, it's more difficult for you, not because of anything or anyone you are. You're the same as I was when I was your age. The difference, however, is 
all of the electronic stuff, all of the cyber stuff has created a world where everything is speed based. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop and read the newspaper. Why? Why would I do that? I just look on my phone. No, there's a reason I continue to subscribe to the newspaper. Yes, the information in here, a lot of it has been superseded. And yes, I'll look on the screen, but I read the paper because it slows me down. I can learn and think differently. And I read it with a pencil to make notes. But he's Hi, not Scott. concerned. Yes, dear. I have a question. So I don't have access to my books because they're still in my dorm. Um, do you think it would be possible for us to get like any sort of PDF version so I could read myself at all? Um, if you put in the chat, I think that some folks have been make the ask and see, can you connect with some folks there? Because I think people are, I don't have access to convert to PDF, but there, I think there's, there are some PDF versions circulating, and I think some of the publishers have started making PDF versions of some of the books, because you know it was against the law to do it before, and that's why I always tell y'all, you know, I know y'all got group me and all that, so that when you talk to each other, but I would ask in the, uh, in the chat, and what I'll also do is send out an email asking if for those who do have access and who have converted to share with the rest of y'all, and try to facilitate that. But that is also one of the reasons why I'm doing the draft text for you all. So that because of your circumstance, very specifically, I know there are some other students who are in that same circumstance, many, a lot of students really. We are, I'm trying to give you as much text as possible so that even if you don't have it, you can, um, you can use all the other stuff. But yeah, I hear you and, and I'll make that ask for people to share. Okay, thank, thank you. you. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, what was his objective for creating a community of companions, or ma that is, around the structure of Per-Ankh? He tells you all about that in chapter 21. Per-Ankh, mm, I can't see, but I can look here on the screen and see. Um, Per-Ankh, a home for life. Per-Ankh is the name, if you remember, of Armas publishing company. It's also the name of his writers and readers and thinkers collected. In fact, I got a whole bookshelf of his books up there per aunt. And he publishes out of Senegal. But that's the, he needs, He said, you can't do this work by yourself. You need teams. You need a community, what he calls companions. Um, what according, and that's kind of what this class is too. According, what according to our minds, the dance of inspiration, we've talked about that. What is the centrality of the concept of property ownership and dispossession as tools for European-oriented colonialism and imperialism. We've talked about that too, dispossession of land. First act in the, in the diaspora, the dispossession of land from the Native Americans. What was the Cold War? How did it shape how Africans around the world organized themselves politically during the post-World War II period, including the relationship of African and Caribbean independence movements to the U.S. Civil Rights Movement? We talked about that a lot in Frame of Question 5, conversation we were having earlier in the week. In summary, the Cold War is kind of like the United States and its allies versus the Soviet Union, the Chinese and their allies. After World War II, they called the Cold War because they weren't necessarily fighting each other physically, although they were fighting each other in places like Vietnam, in Korea, in places like all over the African continent, in places like Latin America, Chile, and places like that. They were using proxy wars to fight each other. And under the idea of the United States would say, well, we're trying to stop communism. Nah, yeah, you're trying to stop the Soviet Union. Those are, and then anybody who you think you can paint with being with the Soviet Union. But in that struggle, the people that the United States or the Soviet Union or China would approach and say, we want you to be on our team. The idea is then that those people would have their own uh, their own way of thinking. In fact, if I could find it quickly, there's a book on the Bandung Conference. I was just looking at it the other day. In 1955, many of those nations who weren't aligned with the Soviets or with the um, United States met in Bandung, Indonesia. They called it the Non-Aligned Movement. We'll talk about that. That's in the review sheet. And they said, we're not going to pick sides. We're going to pick ourselves. And so that becomes a threat. So in the United States, the United States looked at black people and black leaders and was like, yeah, we need y'all to be with us against the Russians. And some people said, okay, we with y'all. But then other people said, we're with humanity. So somebody like Paul Robeson or W.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Islam the Good Robeson, 
the ropes and send the new voices. William uh, Thompson, uh, Louis Thompson, uh, the William Patterson, Louis Thompson Patterson, they were pressing the United States, saying the United States is practicing genocide. And some black leaders were like, yeah, that's going to mean they're going to call y'all communists. And then Robeson and them was like, well, what's wrong with the Soviet Union? Next thing you know, they've taken their passports and they, you know, so, that, so there's, this, there's this real tussle. But at the same time, the United States realized it can't keep treating black people the same way. Because if it does, it's going to make black people say, well, why are we continuing to show loyalty to you? And this is where you see, for example, in the, during World War II, the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper, black newspaper, uh, launched what they called the double victory campaign. Victory at home, victory abroad, two Vs together, double victory. And that double victory campaign was a signal to say, we're not gonna fight Hitler and fight Japan and then come back to the United States and get lynched. This is some BS. In fact, where you really see that begin is, wow, look at that. Just so happened to be in arm's reach. Now, let me see, I'm gonna show y'all something. No, oh, yeah. Professor, can I ask a question when you're done? Yeah, I'll just do this right quick. This is We Return Fighting. This is the exhibit that's at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We Return Fighting. This was after World War I, where they said, we're going to come back and we're going to fight for democracy. We fought the Germans. Now we're going to have to fight some people in the United States because I'm not going to be lynched. And I'm thinking about Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, the man who came back as the vice dean of Howard Law School and train, helped train all those black lawyers that fought Jim Crow, including Thurgood Marshall. He went to World War I, and when he came back, he said, I did not fight so that I would come back to a society ruled by them, meaning these white people. I got to do something about this. So I'll pause there. And yes, yes, Virgil, please jump in, brother. No, this is a quick question. Can, can you explain the difference between uh, colonialism and imperialism? Uh, very quickly. I'm looking for my man Kwame Nkrumah. I had all Nkrumah stuff stacked up because I was moving it the other day. And, uh, hmm. Let me see. I will let you don't have to ponder on it. It's okay. No, 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 no. No, it's very basic. Colonialism is the idea that one group is going to go somewhere else and take another group's land. And then at that other place, they're going to use that land to improve themselves. So colonialism would be like if you came here to my house and said, okay, you now work for Virgil, and so all your reading, all your writing, all your work is going to benefit me. That's colonialism. Imperialism is, a, is, a, is the next stage. So imperialism would look like, okay, not only am I going to work for you, but based on what I do for you, it makes you strong, and then you turn around and come back over here and say, yeah, and while you're at it, I want you to buy this new set of encyclopedias I've developed in my house. What? Yeah, <laughs> in other words, I become part of your empire. And then I start saying, yeah, you know, I, uh, I kind of like the way you dress. I'm going to dress like you. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to sell you the suit. Yeah, but I, I picked the cotton and sent it there. Yes, and now I'm going to sell you a suit with the money that I paid you to pick the cotton. What? So Im imperialism oh. is like the next stage of colonialism. And then, this is why I was looking for Nkrumah. I was looking for his book. He wrote a book called Neocolonialism. He said, Neocolonialism is the highest stage of imperialism. In other words, neocolonialism would then mean after, you know, I resist you and say, I, ca I can't keep doing this, man. And then you say, okay, fine. You know what? I'm not coming over to your house no more. Uh, you're independent. And Krumah says, neocolonialism means, then I say, yeah, but I got used to wearing your suits and talking like you, so I kind of like being with you. You know, I'm going to treat where I live, I'm going to look at everything you do, and I'm going to do it here. So everybody dress like me. Look, we're going to be lawyers, so we're going to put these white wigs on, and it's 100 degrees. Don't matter, because see, this is what they do in England. And I want to be like, so in Krumah's thing is, you start with colonialism, you took my stuff, and now I'm working for you. Then you move to imperialism. We got a relationship now where you assimilated me into your house and I'm still benefiting you, but now I see myself as subject to you. Then you move to neo-colonialism. You cut me loose, but I, want, I still want to be like you and someone make where I am look like you, sound like you, and I'm still going to benefit you. And so Nkrumah then finally says, when you reach that stage, he's really ripping off the work of Vladimir Lenin 
and any number of other people out of what we might call the Bolshevik Revolution, the Soviet Union, the Russians, you know, Stalin and them. But what Nkrumah makes the point of saying is that what comes after that for Africans has to be based on the way Africans view the world, which is why he said, we are not copies of the communists. We had ways of doing things before colonialism happened that we should draw on. In fact, he writes a book, well, he attributed with writing a book called Conscientism, where he says, here's a philosophy that comes out of African ways of knowing. And so he says, we can use this to get past uh, neocolonialism. So in conclusion, colonialism, take the stuff. Imperialism, part of the empire. Neocolonialism, you copied these people and now you're replicating it where you are. Past neocolonialism, you create something of your own that's not depending on these former imperial masters. That's kind of those relationships. Thank anyway. you. Yes. Sir. All right. So what is the role of a cultural whiteness in cementing a relationship between identity status and material benefits for whites during and after reconstruction in the United States? Very basic. Poor whites didn't have anything. Now, in fact, I was just reading up here. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Let me pull this out. I'll pull it out and I'll tell you about it in a second. The, um, after the Civil War was over in the United States, you have poor whites in this country, most of the people in the country, in fact, who didn't have anything. Du Bois and Black Reconstruction in America does a very good job about this. What, what they get, you know what those poor whites get? They get whiteness. In fact, chapter two, this is a more recent print. I won't get the original. It's called The White Worker. He says in this chapter, he's saying the white worker, in fact, let me just go to the beginning because sometimes he's summer. He says, how America became the laborer's promised land and flocking here from all the world, the white workers competed with black slaves, with new floods of foreigners and with growing exploitation until they fought slavery to save democracy and then lost democracy in a new and vaster slavery. Meaning, that these poor whites were told, yes, you don't have anything, but you're not black. And then that racism that they are given creates a buffer where they should be organizing with the black people. Instead, they hold on to racism and as a result, hurt themselves and the black people. Like in the state of Georgia, Brian Kemp, clearly a white supremacist, is saying, we're going to open Georgia. Now, poor white people, instead of saying, what are you doing? I'm the one that's going to be harmed. Say, yeah, we're going to go with you. Let's go open Georgia, liberate Georgia. What are you doing? We're going to die. Predominantly black Atlanta. Black people now are trying to tell their young people until we live. Everybody just stay at home, please, if you can. I know some people have to work, but if you don't, please stay at home. Now they got to fight a racist governor and poor white people and others who they should be with saying the same thing. But racism blinds them to their common class interests. And this is what Du Bois spent his life trying to help people understand before he said, yeah, it ain't going to work. I'll see y'all later. Holla. And went to Ghana. He said, that's it. It's not going to work. These people are never going to give up the racism. And I'm an old man. I'm going to go sit on the beach. So <laughs> let's continue. So how do state boundaries serve as placeholders for economic and political power? Well, actually, not. I'm going to stay at the beach. I'm going to write this Encyclopedia Africana. And in the, you know, in the evening, I'll drink me a little something and have a little good time. But state boundaries are those artificial lines. We already talked about that. For a or ma, why have discussions of style as opposed to content been pushed to the background in discussions of African literature and by extension, African cultural productions? That's page 241, The Eloquence of the Scribes. And I'll let you all. I'll let you all, you can read it for yourselves. I won't read it to you. You can look at it when you get off, when I put, when we post this recording. There it is right there in that chapter that I want to describe. What are Professor Ron Walters' five types of Pan-African relationships? We talked about that on Tuesday on Framing Question 6. I did go over a couple of those slides. I'll post Framing Question 6 PowerPoint after I get off the call. Framing Question 5 has already been posted. What are the four processes for using cultural and intellectual tradition that Shoyinka features in part two of Of Africa? We talked about that extensively on Tuesday uh, in the discussion of framing question five. That video will be posted today. I was told by the Sankofa people today, be po being posted today. That's in part two of, of Africa. We talked about that a lot. What is the specific tradition that he offers as a rich source for retrieval, guidance, exchange, and arbitration for Africans and others? He uses the Yoruba tradition. We talked about that as well. 
What example does Shoyinka give in chapter eight of Of Africa to symbolize the need to depolarize cultural combatants in the struggle to have Africa and African people emerge as full human participants in world societies? He uses the example, remember we talked about the opera where all the different religions were being satirized, but there's no African representative. That's the example that he's using. He says, I'm not mad because they're doing satire. I'm mad because you don't think the African traditions are worthy of satire. You don't even know about the African traditions. It's very important. Historical figures, organizations, and places. Let's keep going. What was Abraham Lincoln's idea for colonization? Oh man, we lucky today. I was moving books and I got them all within arm's reach. This is my man, the great Lerone Bennett Jr. I have a number of books by Lerone Bennett Jr. that are signed by Lerone Bennett. I don't think this is my copy mm -hmm. of Forced in the Glory. It's signed by him. But you see what that says? Forced in the Glory, Abraham Lincoln's White Dream. Lerone Bennett, one of the most important historians of the 20th century. Morehouse Man from Clarksdale, Mississippi. At any rate, Martin Luther King's mm -hmm. friend. Lerone Bennett, and we talked about this in class, it, he, he tracks the fact that Abraham Lincoln's idea was yes we are going to in fact do i have that here mm, i don't see it that's too bad oh yeah look look at that ancestors are working today last week was emancipation day compensated emancipation and in the in the district of columbia abraham lincoln signed congressional legislation which freed the africans of the district mm -hmm. of columbia but paid the, the Europeans who had them enslaved up to $300 a piece per body. It's called compensated emancipation. They also set aside money so that any African who wanted to, they would pay for them to lead the country. Because Abraham Lincoln believed that white people were superior to black people and that white people and black people, you know, didn't need to live together. So Abraham Lincoln's idea was for colonization, meaning, I'm gonna send you to another country. One of them was Nicaragua that they looked at. Another one was Haiti. He said, that may be a place to go. Now, of course, while he was doing that, this brother who knew Lincoln, Lincoln made him a major. In fact, in the United States military, because he said, I'm gonna get some black troops and we are gonna end this war. That's Martin Delaney. Remember we talked about Blake? Martin Delaney was like, Africa ain't so bad. I've been to Africa, 1859. I think we should leave too, maybe. And so he was like, yeah, we could leave. So they went back and forth. But he said, what you're not going to do is run me out of America because my ancestors are buried here too. And so therefore, I'm going to fight for my liberation and maybe I'll leave, maybe I won't. But Abraham Lincoln, to the fact, and that's why the Lincoln historians, they did not like Lerone Bennett. They, I love this brother. The last time I saw Lerone Bennett, in fact, alive, I was in a bookstore in the west side, south side of Chicago, 57th Street. And I'm on my hands and knees looking at books. And I looked and I saw a pair of dress shoes next to me. Somebody standing next to me. I looked up. It was the great Lerone Bennett. We were in the American history section. And I said, Lerone Bennett. He looked down at me. Hey, brother. I said, what you doing, man? You know what he said? He said, I'm hunting Lincoln, brother. I'm hunting Lincoln. I love Lerone Bennett. But at any rate, Lincoln was a heroic figure in American history. He's also a complicated figure. And as far as I'm concerned, along with Lerone Bennett, he's a white supremacist. And yeah, people so it was a it was a product of his time. I don't give a damn what time it was. So, what was the role of Liberia in movements for 19th century African American repatriation? One of the places they sent black people to, beginning in 1847, black people in the diaspora, that is, was Liberia. Who was Martin Robeson Delaney? Just talked about him. Uh, born in Charlestown, West Virginia, grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, eventually becomes the first commission major in the United States military of African descent, he and a dude named Augusta, who was a surgeon at Freedman's Hospital, uh, Howard now, of course, C.B. Powell, uh, who was Martin Robeson Delaney and how did his life work and work symbolize both Pan-Africanism and commitment to the American freedom struggle? I just told y'all, Delaney uh, believed in black self-determination. In fact, I got all Delaney's books piled up around here somewhere, but I won't pause right now to go through them. Uh, but he believed that we should fight for our liberation wherever we are, including in the United States military if we need to. What activity undertaken by Harriet Ross Tubman during the U.S. Civil War distinguished her service from subsequent women? She's the first woman to direct troops in battle in the American military. She was never a commissioned member of the military. Her husband was, though. Um, but she directed troops. I talked about this in the video, so I'll keep going. Uh, the ones that have been posted already for framing question four. What were the circumstances surrounding her payment from the United States government for her military service? As I said, she wasn't in the military. Her husband was. 
she was supposed to get a quote unquote widow's pension, which is like hilarious. She was a soldier too, but she didn't get paid as a soldier. But because her husband was in the military, she's supposed to get a pension after he died. She never got it. Eventually, Hillary Clinton, when she was a senator from New York, wrote uh, legislation and they gave Harriet Tubman her pension and interest after some school children from New York City went to her house in Auburn, New York, heard the story I'm telling y'all and came back to the city and told Hillary Clinton, get on your job. Harriet Tubman need her money, run her her check. And they used that money to help support the Harriet Tubman house, which is a National Park Service site. Did she not get it before because she was like, was there like sexism or they just didn't care? You already know both them things. <laughs> you already know. Sexism, the worst kind of sexism, the worst kind of sexism in the intersectional analysis is black sexism against black women. No question. No, they did not care. And they just didn't give her her money. But of course, what I'm telling you about those school children happened in your lifetime. Uh, well, just about. Hillary Clinton was senator and then she became secretary of state under Obama. So yeah, yeah, y'all would have been just going to elementary school when this thing went down. And um, yeah, not only, did, not only did Tubman's estate get the money, they got it with interest. So now all that money went, and, and what she was, this is actually, I'm glad you, you asked me, what she was using her money for, she was raising money. She's a member of the AME Zion Church, Ways of Knowing. She used that money to purchase land in Auburn, New York. She said, I'm going to create a retirement home for ex-slaves. Like, wow, that's really something. Some of the first people who went there, she took there, were her parents. Harriet Tubman, brilliant sister, she bought that property for Africans who had spent their lives as enslaved people and then they could live the rest of their lives in peace. And so she was raising money for that anyway. How ironic is it that during your lifetime, that finally the money that she was owed during her lifetime, denied because of the sexism, denied because of the neglect of this heroic figure. How ironic is it that while you walk the earth, the rest of that, that money they owed her with interest went to the thing that she was doing anyway. And the Amy Zion Church co-manages that site with the National Park Service. I've been there many times. And if you ever get a chance, go to the Harriet Tubman home in Auburn, New York. It's near Buffalo, New York, upstate New York. I think y'all would really, really love it. And she's buried not far from there uh, and under a big monument near a tree in the cemetery near her house. So yes, it's actually not just a house. It's got a lot of property and stuff. It's very nice. All right, so uh, the African Union, uh, Virgil. I think you talked about this uh, a couple of couple of weeks ago. Uh, the yeah. African, yeah, the African Union, of course, started in 1992. Replaced the Organization of African Unity started in the early 1960s. It's the notion of a United States of Africa, at least a common connection between the countries of Africa. Robert Mangaliso Subukwe. I was just looking at uh, no, Amico, Stephen Bantubiko, Stephen Bantubiko. They're talked about in something torn and new chapter, the South Africa chapter, which is chapter four, from color to consciousness, from color to social consciousness, South Africa and the black, Amer black imagination. This is a speech that Ngugi gave at the Steve Biko, uh, Steve Biko conference that they have every year. My man, uh, Nkosamante Biko, I uh, actually went the 30th anniversary of his father's death. Um, actually, I, was able to give a talk. Uh, I think Tabo and Becky gave the main talk that week, that year. But Subukwe and Biko were proponents of black consciousness. That was the ide ideology that Ngugi helped, uh, credits them for helping to create. Um, and I know there's a PDF of uh, something torn and new, and I know some of y'all have it. I'm gonna make that plea again on Blackboard today that people share their resources. Uh, what was the African National Congress? He talks about that there. Uh, what country was it founded in? South Africa. The South African Native National Congress started in 1912. Um, its most famous leader, of course, uh, Madiba Nelson Rolehlahla Mandela. Um, Nelson Mandela was a member of the ANC Youth League as a young man. And then, of course, eventually after coming out of Robben Island, he is elected first uh, president of South Africa, not uh, of liberated South Africa as a member of the African National Congress political party, which had been banned before uh, while he was in prison. Arlington National Cemetery was a plantation before it was a cemetery. It was actually owned by Robert E. Lee. Um, that's one of the famous families in the US social structure, but Robert E. Lee had married into the family, the Custis family, because the property had begun life as a plantation owned by George Martha Washington and Martha Washington's daughter uh, 
set up shop there. So it's the Washingtons and the Lee. And if y'all know in Virginia, there's a Washington and Lee University. So, you know, old times in the South are not forgotten, or maybe they are. And what two famous families in the U.S. social structure had control of the land at one time or another? I just told y'all. Why was Baltimore the key city in the so-called domestic slave trade in the U.S. after 1808? Look at your map book. You'll see why. Uh, Baltimore is in Maryland. Maryland was a southern state, a plantation state, a pro-slavery state. And Baltimore was the city where um, Fred Douglas writes about this, where even if, you, if you're in Baltimore, if you're Black, you could be walking the streets of Baltimore as an enslaved person, or you could be walking as a free person. Remember, Fred Douglas's wife, Anna, was free. In fact, it was her money, her labor, that financed uh, Douglas's escape. So it's very important to understand. I'm not talking about the woman he married very near the end of his life, Jane Pitts, the white lady. He was oh, Fred Douglas was married to a white woman. No, he was married to a white woman, yes, but very late in life. His wife, who died, uh, the mother of their children, uh, Lewis and all, all, you know, the daughters and everything else, she was black, Anna Douglas, Anna Murray Douglas. And Anna Murray Douglas was a free woman in Baltimore. Baltimore is a dangerous city for black people. Because if they had you, they, they hear you up on the streets of Baltimore and ask you to run your papers and you can show them their papers and they tear the papers up. Next thing they put you up behind on a boat and you somewhere in Louisiana. Remember, Solomon Northrop is in New York State when they drug him. Next thing you know, he's in Arlington, Virginia. So it's a dangerous city. But they used it in the domestic slave trade because that was a port city and they could ship people out of those ports. Very dangerous. As were many other port cities like Wilmington, Delaware, like Philadelphia, which was in the north, but close to Delaware. So you had to be careful down near the river in Philly because if they snatched you off the shore on the Philly and on, on the, uh, the shore in Philly, down near South Street, Delaware River, put you on the thing. Delaware is a slave state. They were good for stealing people. What was the Freedmen's Bureau? What ethnic racial group did it serve in the largest number? Poor whites. Freedmen's Bureau was the first social welfare uh, uh, organ of the federal government. Freedmen's Bureau served more poor whites than it did blacks. If you look in your map book, there's a map. I really wish I knew what I did. So this is the problem. I stay up moving books and looking at stuff, and now I don't know what I did with the map book. If y'all give me another 15 seconds. I'm just really surprised because normally, oh, here it is. Hold up. Ah, I can't move. There we go. I put it all the way over there by my other desk. Uh, give me a second. Freedmen's Bureau, and I'll tell you the map. The Freedmen's Bureau is going to be on Maps, uh, map 74, unit six. There's the Freedmen's Bureau. See it there? All the places it served. All right, in fact, while I'm here, if you give me 15 more seconds, I will show you the Garvey one we were talking about. Radical Republicans, Buffalo Soldiers, uh, Partition of Africa. Give me another five, four, three, two, one, and Yes, map 97, there's the Garvey movement. You see all those chapters in the United States? Now, if you go up, you'll see other chapters, different places, the Caribbean, you see Africa, you see the numbers, but the greatest number, the United States. That's the whole point. All right, who are the radical Republicans? How did they work with the Africans in the Southern United States to carry out radical reconstruction from 1866 to 77? Long, complex story. If you got time and after the finals are over, you can read Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America. But short story is the radical Republicans were people in Congress who said, y'all moving too slow, Abraham Lincoln, then Andrew Johnson. They then reach out to Black people in the South after the passage of the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, right to vote, or at least if you're in a federal election, you can't be denied to vote if you're a Black man. Gender, of course, again, rears its head. 19th Amendment, it takes for black for women, and black women still had to fight with black men to get that right to vote secure in the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, pursuant to the 15th and 14th Amendments. But they went south in 1866, 1867, 1868, and they get black people to really start the Republican Party in the South, and that's the party that black people use to acquire political power in the South. 
during what's so-called radical reconstruction. It ends after the federal government makes a deal, the Democrats and Republicans make a deal between Democrats and Republicans in the election of 1876. The Republicans tell the Democrats, if you let us be the president, because the election was contested in several states. There's a map on that, in fact. And the, con the contest was South Carolina, contest was in, uh, they, were, they were arguing in Florida and in Louisiana. And here it is, Compromise of 1877. You see that map, the Compromise of 1877. That is map number 83. When they, agree, they, their agreement was the president of the United States would be Rutherford B. Hayes, who was a Republican. The Democrats gave up, the, they, they stopped contesting the votes in those three states. And in return, Hayes and the Republicans agreed to basically let white people in the South, the Democrats do whatever the hell they wanted with black people in the South. And that's when you see Jim Crow come in. It doesn't happen right after the Civil War. Jim Crow happens after the end of Reconstruction, radical Reconstruction. Who are the exodusters and how did what they prefigure, how did what they did prefigure the later US Great Migration? The exodusters were Africans who left the South. That is map number 84, African-American migration to Kansas, not just Kansas. They say, you know what? This Jim Crow is crazy, all this Klan activity and stuff. We going out West. They went with places like Nicodemus, Kansas. If y'all watched Watchmen with the great um, um, Regina King, um, if y'all watched that HBO one, ser one year, one, one series uh, show, Watchmen, she was in Tulsa. Remember the Tulsa riot of 18, uh, 1921? A lot of those Africans had moved out there to Oklahoma the same way they moved to Kansas. They left the South going out there for looking for freedom. Thomas Daddy Rice was uh, the, the guy, the white man in the 1840s and 50s became famous because of a character he portrayed on stage, became one of the biggest entertainers in, the, in America. The character he created based on dances he said he saw black people doing on the plantations was a dude named Jim Crow. And Jim Crow becomes the label for those racist laws, it becomes almost the cultural logic of white supremacy. The Jim Crow laws are based on the idea that black people are inferior. So don't get off the sidewalk, don't look me in the eye, uh, drink out your own water fountain. Why? Because y'all people are coons. How you, what, what do you mean I'm a coon? Well, I was watching this entertainer and you know, I see y'all always eye bucking and eye rolling, which is why when people say somebody is cooning, they're really talking about minstrelsy. And the greatest minstrel performer, white minstrel performer of the, 20th, of the 19th century was Thomas Rice, who said he was doing black people dances, the Jim Crow, jumping Jim Crow. What were the Colored Farmers National Alliance and, co and uh, Cooperative Union? There's a map on that as well. The map on the Colored Farmers Union, map 86. There it is right there. It basically tells you about an attempt by black farmers to pool their resources, to use that to create bigger blocks of land they own, farmers, and they even reached out to white farmers to try to do that work. In fact, there is, man, y'all, we rolling today because you know most of my books are in storage, but of the ones I have here, some of them are in, this comes a little later. This is H.T. H. Mitchell, who's a white dude, called Mean Things Happening in This Land. They tried it again with blacks and whites. This is, a movement in American labor where he talks about the Southern tenant farmers. They said, we tired of being sharecroppers, let's blacks and whites get together. But this was always a problem. Here's an extra treat on a Thursday morning. This is a signed copy, H.T. Mitchell. Anyway, I got a lot of those things around here, but who do I get to talk to but y'all? I thought I was gonna be an academic when I came to Howard, but today I'm academic. Corona is making me into academic again. The Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union was an attempt for black farmers to get together to use their political strength. That, that one happened in the 1880s and 90s. When was the Ku Klux Klan founded and where? 1866, Pulaski, Tennessee. When was it refounded and where? Uh, it was refounded Thanksgiving week, Stone Mountain, Georgia, on the top of Stone Mountain, Georgia, with a flaming cross, an open Bible, and a sword. And those of you in Atlanta or whoever been down there, you know they still got them four Confederate generals etched in the side of Stone Mountain. You can well, take field trips. <laughs> yep, you know, you know exactly where I'm talking about. I'm surprised Brian Kemp didn't get his damn press conference from up there. But at any rate, who were the 24th, 25th Infantry and the 9th and 10th Cavalry, and what were they called collectively? The Buffalo Soldiers in the heart of America. The Buffalo Soldiers were 
Many of them were veterans of the, uh, let me see if I, I could find it very quickly. Oh, by the way, uh, the Klan, there's a map, map 88, it talks about that. The Buffalo Soldiers, I can't find it quickly, so I won't go on. We, there's a map on the Buffalo Soldiers. Give me another 30 seconds. Yeah, map 82. Here you go where many of them were stationed. Some of those Buffalo Soldiers end up fighting in World War I. In fact, the most prominent one, Colonel Charles Young. In fact, I was just looking at Charles Young's memoir over there. Um, Asa Philip Randolph uh, was the brother who started the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Chambermaids in 1925. Uh, if you have your map book, and if you've got a PDF of the map book, please share it. Again, I'm going to reach out to everybody and ask if you will share your resources. I was looking to see. Yeah, he doesn't have one. I thought he had one in here. Um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Chambermaids was the first black union in, in the United States. A. Philip Randolph, who came out of Jacksonville, Florida, his wife owned beauty parlors in Chicago and helped fund him going around the country, organizing those women and men that worked on the railroads, these black women and black men. And then in 1941, he threatened to bring black people to Washington, D.C. and have a march on Washington because when the war started, there were gonna be jobs opened up. He said they should be jobs for black people. And Roosevelt, got so scared, he made an executive order desegregating jobs in the military. And that's how a lot of people ended up migrating to places like Seattle and Portland and LA and the Bay Area and Oakland and San Diego. They went out there for jobs. In fact, uh, Brother Cedric Robinson's uh, grandfather had to get out of Alabama for some, you know, he, he wouldn't let this white man violate his, mother, his wife. And so they end up in the Bay Area. Robinson was raised in Oakland. And a lot of people out in the Bay Area worked in the ship industry. And that becomes, a, that's, a, that's the option because a, Rand, a Philip Randolph and them forced Roosevelt to open those jobs up. And then of course, 20 years later, the March on Washington, when Dr. King and them come to DC for the second time, the first prayer breakfast in, on the Lincoln Memorial steps was 1957. Mordecai Johnson was there from Howard, by the way. But in 1963, when they do that, out of tribute of the, or the man they called the old man, or two men they did that, call that, Du Bois and A. Philip Randolph, they told Randolph, you know, brother, this marching on Washington stuff, this was your idea. So why don't you speak first? And so A. Philip Randolph opened the March on Washington in 1963. Every march that there will ever be to Washington, D.C., the Women's March, the March for Life, the March for Our Lives, any march there will ever be in Washington, D.C., has uh, one man uh, to, they owe it to one man for the idea of coming to Washington like that in them gangster numbers. And that's A. Philip Randolph in that form. Now, there was also something called the Bonus March, but that's a story for another day. I'll tell y'all about that another day. What was the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Chambermaids? Just told you. Who were the 369th and 370th regiments, and where did they come from? The 369th were the brothers in World War I who came out of the East Coast, out of New York, the armory, still uptown in New York City. The 370th, the old 8th Illinois, the Harlem Hellfighters were the 369th. That's what they called them. In fact, they're prominently figured in the We Return Fighting piece I told y'all about. It's at the museum. Go to the museum's website. Y'all can read all about it. The 370th, the old 8th Illinois, them was the Negroes that were coming primarily out of Chicago, the Midwest. And they were, uh, that's where they were from, and they fought in World War I. Uh, you can read about them in Black Movements in America. Chicago Defender was the Black newspaper out of Chicago. What role, wow, yeah, I gotta, nah, come on, I can't keep pulling books. What role did it play in encouraging the, the Great Migration? Very quickly, remember I told y'all, A. Philip Randolph's wife was working out of Chicago, Randolph ends up living in Chicago. That's where the rail lines used to meet up, so that's where it was the best place to organize the black men and women working on the railroads, the sleeping car porters and chambermaids. So they walked their headquarters in Chicago. He also had a place here in D.C., A. Philip Randolph, but, the Chicago Defender was Black America's paper. The Courier, there were a lot of Black newspapers. That's why I was looking for this book on the Associated Negro Press. I see it, but I'm not going to stop here. Uh, we'll keep going. The Defender was the paper. Everybody read The Defender. And even if you couldn't read, you could see the pictures of Black people living it up in Chicago. Jack Johnson, Louis Armstrong. Black railroad workers living in Chicago would get copies of The Defender in bundles and hide them in the floorboards of the train or in their uh, personal effects. And then as the train would go through the South, Louisiana, Mississippi, at night, in the middle of the night, they would get, the, get their stash out because if they got caught with it, they could get fired. 
they would get their stash of papers out of the defender and throw them out the back of the train, throw them out the sides of the train. And black people would go out and get the copies and distribute them. That's how so many Negroes in Mississippi found out, oh, Chicago, we gotta get to Chicago, man. And they started leaving. That's why so many, it's one of the reasons, many other reasons, but that's one of the reasons that many black people in Chicago from Mississippi, their, their ancestors were reading The Defender and it encouraged that migration. Negro leaves, there's a map uh, in here, 1920, the great Andrew Rube Foster starts The Negro Leaves. Y'all can read about that for yourselves. Uh, in fact, I'll give you the map number in about 30 seconds, as soon as I can run here and see. Yep, map 99, the Roaring Twenties and the Rise of the Negro Leagues. Three great players come into white major, many great players, Satchel Page and others, but three of the players whose names you all will recognize came out of the Negro Leagues into white major league baseball. The first, you know, Jack Roosevelt Robinson out of Cairo, Georgia, 1947. He played for the Kansas City Monarchs, and then he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, another brother by the name of Willie Howard Mays played for the Birmingham Black Barons, but he became a Hall of Famer in white Major League Baseball for playing for the New York and then San Francisco Giants. And then the final man, uh, Henry Aaron, the Hammer. He and his wife, Billy, still in Atlanta. Henry Aaron played for the Indianapolis Clowns. Then he joined the Milwaukee Blade, Braves of white Major League Baseball, then the Atlanta Braves. And so those last two brothers are still alive in their 80s, Willie Mays and the great Han Henry Aaron, Hank Aaron, the Hammer. All right, Marcus Garvey, we talked about that. Jamaican who founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World. Smoke Yankees fought in the Spanish-American War. These are all things we talked about in Frame of Question 5. Y'all can look at that video if you want. Uh, the Cubans called them Smoke Yankees because they called the American soldiers Yankees. Then they saw these black Yankees and like, yeah, y'all look like us. And they called them Smoke Yankees. Booker T. Washington from Virginia. What school did he found? Tuskegee. Uh, 1881, oh, is that Morris Brown? No, Morris Brown goes before that. Well, 1882, I think, Tuskegee. Uh, NAACP was founded in 1909 by what group of leaders? Mostly white liberals, Henry Moskowitz, Mary White Ovington, William Walling, Oswald Garrison Villard. What was its relationship to the Niagara Movement and black elite political leadership at the turn of the 20th century? Y'all can read about that for yourselves. I would pull Ida B. Wells' autobiography. In fact, I was just, look at, no, that's, huh. I was reaching for Ida B. Wells and came up with Kwame Nkrumah. This is one of the Nkrumahs I was talking about, but here's Ida B. Wells. Ida Wells wrote her own autobiography, Crusader for Justice, and she talks about this. Ida B. Wells didn't trust many of the white liberals she had worked in the suffragist movement with those white women organizing the vote. And she said, I'm always race first. I'm a woman and I'm black. So if you read in Cedric Robinson's book, uh, some of them, Ida Wells, William Monroe Trotter, they thought, yeah, we have a Niagara movement. We've got black political leadership. We believe in alliances with white people, but we don't believe in being told what to do with white people. And a lot of people don't know the NLACP was started by white people. Du Bois was the only black member of the executive committee of the NAACP at the beginning, and he took over the Crisis Magazine. Let's keep going. It's 12 o'clock, y'all give me, I know some people gotta go, give me about 15 more minutes, I'm gonna go through the whole thing, and that way you can watch it whenever you want. Um, and for those of you who have to go, a reminder, the final exam will be uh, two essay questions and 20 uh, multiple choice questions. The multiple choice questions will be administered from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. next Thursday. I'm moving it down a little bit and expanding the time so that West Coast people and other time zone people will have an opportunity. It shouldn't take you more than 15, 20 minutes to answer these questions. And they're only worth 20% of your grade. 40% of your grade, that's gonna be essay one. The other 40% of your grade will be essay question two. Those questions will be posted uh, on Friday. On Friday the 24th, and you will have until uh, 1159 p.m. on Thursday the 30th to answer. So you'll have six days to answer them. I'm also going to provide some draft text, uh, short essays on framing questions four, five, and six. You'll have those on Monday. I'm trying to get you get them to you Monday morning. Um, and then you'll have those as a resource. If, you, if you've got PDF versions of the books, if those people who don't have their books, please share them with each other. I'll remind you. But I want to do that housekeeping before I keep going because I know some people might have to leave at 12. Um, and we also quick, talk quick question. Oh, my yes. bad, Dr. No, no, you're good. Jump on in. Like, what's up? I was uh, gonna ask. So I, I seen a uh, on the review. It said 
three to six uh, pages for the essay questions. Is that together or is that? Perfect? No, that's 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 why I said each. I put each on there, three to six each. So you okay, know, you you okay, might okay. end up if if you doing it real short, you might end up with six pages because you may do three for one and three for two. Uh, you can okay. do as many as twelve pages though, six for each, um, or very. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. I have a I question. See. Yes. So for like FQ, um, yeah, frame question five and frame question six. Yeah. Um, I see that like the videos haven't been posted. So if they're posted on Monday, I hope they're not due Friday because that's four essays we gotta do, and that's that's kind of a lot. Frame so question five would... will be posted today. That's what they told me. Um, Sankofa. Frame question six is optional. There won't be a video for frame of question six. You just have okay. to grab text. So, so um, frame yeah, question five. Oh, oh, oh no no no. Oh you don't you don't mean yes, yes. We talked about that. In fact, I'll put that in the email as well. The the in, any outstanding framing questions will be due by May the first. So in other words, a week from tomorrow. I moved it back again because they hadn't been posted. Yeah, okay. you, you meant you meant like due tomorrow. No, yeah. I was saying like um if their videos are posted to tomorrow or whenever I hope we get a lot of time to be able to submit it. Yeah, they won't be due they won't be due tomorrow. I extended it. Yeah, we extended it on Tuesday when we when we were in class. We talked about it. So yeah, we thank we, you. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. 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 Thank you. Because there's somebody else who probably had that question. All right, y'all. I can knock the rest of these out fairly quickly. It says five through eight, but we're gonna go quick. Um yes. Yeah, um, I sent a, I sent um, a note in the chat. The thing is, I have a lot of exams on the 30th. And with, most of the times, it's clashing with most of my exams. I don't know if you can. Yeah, you have, you have, you have exam. Okay. Um, shoot me and shoot Miss uh, Carter an email. We may have to come okay. up with some alternative arrangement for you. But uh, so you have exams during that whole window of 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard on I have exam almost almost like all day. I mean, I have like three exams that day. So either with yours is gonna be like how four, in the world including with the projects. I have projects I have to submit as MD oh, two projects, I see. Uh okay. Okay we'll 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 have to we'll email me separately and we'll 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 we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll have to figure something out. Okay. We, the thing we want to make sure is we know we're all laboring in these difficult circumstances. And so we're all in faculty is doing the same thing. So we'll, we'll figure it out. We want all, everybody to get to a safe port in this storm. So let me, let me, let me look at this now and see most of what we see now I covered in framing question four. Those videos of course have been posted or framing question five. Framing question five, that video will be posted uh, today. Um, in fact, I heard from the Sankofa people. If y'all wanna go on Sankofa's YouTube channel, well, I don't know if it would have been posted yet because they, they wrote me back uh, this morning. I wrote them and they wrote me back. <laughs> so we're good. Um, so these are really ones you can go back and look at those videos. So I'm just gonna kind of mention these going fairly quickly. Uh, relationship Excuse me, Dr. Carter. Yes, dear. Um, would the possibility being like an option of one or two for the um for the final essays instead of both of them? No, <laughs> that that's one of the few times in twenty years I could easily say definitively no. Don't worry, you you're gonna when you get the essay questions, you'll see they they'll be very straightforward, and you'll get them tomorrow, and you have plenty of time. So I mean, three pages a piece, you you'll be able to knock them out. Yeah, it won't be, it won't be. It won't be hard, particularly if you watch this review session, because I'm going through basically the whole semester emphasizing four, five, and six. You'll be able to answer those questions. Trust me. It's not going to be, you won't have, look, I take blood pressure medicine. I, don't, I got an underlying condition. That's one reason I got to stay away from everybody. I don't want your underlying conditions triggered either. <laughs> no stress. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to be all right. <laughs> so let's continue very quickly. Uh, what does the relationship between Channel Pozo and John Diz Gillespie teach us about the culture mini making between Africans from different countries? Look at framing question four, the first uh, couple of slides. I talk about that a lot. So if you go back to those videos, the last one I did in class or the first one I did at Sankofa, you can look within the first 20 minutes and see that. What were the numbers of Africans who served in the following wars? American Revolution on all sides, 
that's tough. About 5,000 for the uh, George Washington's army, about the same number for the British because we were fighting for freedom. And Virginia alone, 30,000 at least ran away. U.S. Civil War, Army and Navy, about 10,000 in the Navy, about 179,000 in the U.S. Army. These are the official people, like Martin Delaney and them, not counting the many others who fought who were not officially enrolled, or like Harriet Tubman, who never got credit because they weren't enrolled because they didn't let women fight, technically, although she fought. World Wars I and II, those numbers are in Black movements in America. I would, I would encourage y'all to go look that up for yourselves or share that number because off the top of my head, it escapes me. Uh, according to Du Bois, what according to him were the African roots of World War I? Uh, du Bois says they were fighting over African resources. Even though the war was between European countries, part of it was about controlling the African colonies. Who was Kwame Nkrumah? We just talked about Francis Kwame Nkrumah. What I do with Nkrumah? Anyway, and what invitation did he extend to Martin and Coretta King and Louis Armstrong in 1957? Kwame Nkrumah was the first prime minister of independent Ghana, 1957. He asked Martin and Coretta King to go there. There's a slide. I talk about that in framing question four. What was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and what distinct ties did it have to Howard University in Washington, D.C. with regard to its leadership? Much of its leadership came from Howard. Uh, there was some called the Nonviolent Action Group. If we had stayed, if the virus hadn't hit, we, you would have been able to go to the 60th anniversary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were supposed to be holding it in D.C. Uh, this spring. We would have been just past it now. SNCC was founded in 1960 at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, students came from all over the South, primarily. Uh, Washington, D.C., Howard had something called the Nonviolent Action Group. You had people like Charlie Cobb. Uh, you had people like uh, Stokely Carmichael, philosophy student, philosophy major at Howard University. They became part of the first leadership of SNCC. The first leader of SNCC was Marion Berry. Marion Berry was a graduate student at the University of Tennessee, had come out of Lemoyne College, Lemoyne Owen now out of Memphis. He's born in Mississippi. Of course, he becomes the mayor of Washington, D.C. at some point. Jesse Jackson ran president of the United States in 1984 and 1988. Um, a Dixie Kratt is a Democrat who's a white supremacist, came of really prominence in the 1940s and 50s. They belonged to the Democratic Party. When and why did they switch national political parties? After the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act of 65, you saw many of these white supremacists in the Democratic Party say the Democratic Party had abandoned them. They accused Lyndon Johnson from Texas, President of the United States, of betraying them. So they left the Democratic Party and went to the Republican Party, which is where they still are. Who was Rosa Parks? Born in Montgomery, Alabama, 1913, about two months before Harriet Tubman passed. Actually not Montgomery, she's born in Tuskegee, Alabama. What role did she play in the NLACP before serving as the face of the Montgomery bus boycott? Give me 30 seconds, y'all. I can't resist because I just was looking at this last night. Rosa Parks was the sister at 43 years old who refused to give up her seat on the bus. There's a great exhibit at the Library of Congress on Rosa Parks. There she is as an older lady. Y'all know her looking like that. Let's go back to the, oh, there she goes, the stage photograph of her sitting on the bus, right? But Rosa Parks from Tuskegee, Alabama, very early on, uh, she actually, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. Here she go, one of her boyfriends when she was a young girl. Oh, the parts fly. Y'all know I can't resist. Anyway, I know I know y'all gotta go. We gotta go. So um, that's her husband, Raymond. Raymond is here. Raymond Parts was a barber, a barber in Alabama. They were very, very important couple. Miss Parts, anyway, I'll give you one more. She gonna speak it to us here in Baltimore, Mrs. Rosa Parks. Anyway, she uh, she was the secretary of the NAACP Youth League, uh, the NAACP Youth Chapter in Montgomery, Alabama. She was an older lady who helped. I say older in her forties, late thirties, early forties, helping these young people. She also worked in the NAACP, taking the testimony of black women who had been assaulted and/or raped by white men in the South. She took the testimony of Reese Taylor, if y'all heard that name. Ms. Parks was an activist, in other words, and a warrior in Alabama long before that bus. Uh, counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, what was it? Federal surveillance of black people. What was its relationship to Jagger Hoover and the black liberation struggle of the 60s and 70s? Hoover spied on everybody, the Panthers, uh, the US organization, black radicals, so to speak, and white ones like the Weather Underground. Hoover had started his work with something called racial condition, the racial condition project, in the 1920s, 
Before that, he spied on Marcus Garvey, who was Elijah Muhammad. 1890s, he was born in 1897, Sandersville, Georgia, as Elijah Poole, the organization that he helped found. He joined something called the Nation of Islam. Uh, why do members of the organization refer to Detroit as Mecca? Because that was the first temple of the Nation of Islam. So in Islam, they call Mecca, that's the holy site where you see the beginning of Islam. Chicago was temple number two. That becomes the second holiest site. So they take that name as, as well from Islam, the second holiest site, Medina. Additionally, when did Howard begin to shift its unofficial nickname from the capstone of Negro education, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, to the Mecca? In fact, some Negroes still refer to it as the capstone, but we ain't gonna get into that. They started calling it the Mecca during the Black Power Movement and the student protest movement in the 1950s and uh, 1960s, really, and 70s, the Black Power Movement, in part because of Malcolm X, and Malcolm was in the nation. So when people call Howard the Mecca, you ask yourself, why would you use an Islamic term? It was the nation of Islam, it was black power, the Mecca. The hand, yeah, that comes from the Godfather. I don't even know where Negroes started getting that stuff from. Anyway, what was the significance of the Soweto student movement of 1976? Uh, Armand writes about that in his book, and so y'all can read about that in The Eloquence of the Scribes. And what impact did young poets from the movement have on him? They impressed him. Ayikwe Armand was impressed by the black student movement and the student poets the Soweto poets, when he met them in Southern Africa, when he was teaching down there. And so he writes about that in the Eloquence of the Scribes in the first uh, eight chapters. Uh, who is Gerald Horn? How does he characterize what happened to some formerly enslaved Africans after the end of the Civil War in Brazil, Hawaii, and Mexico? I would encourage you just to go back to Framing Question 5. Uh, that video, like I say, is being posted today, and I show you all of Horn's books. That will happen probably around the hour mark, hour and 20 minute mark. Who is Aslanda Good Robeson, the wife of Paul Robeson? Uh, she, uh, what was her husband's stand on the role of socially conscious black artist? He said that the artist must fight for revolution. He was looking for his book, Here I Stand. Aslanda Robeson, uh, Essie Robeson, I have her book over there too, but anyway, I keep looking over there because I just moved up some Robeson books. They were a couple who believed in fighting fascism everywhere. She was an anthropologist by training. She was a scientist by training as well. And I talk about her a lot in Framing Question 4. And you all can see that video. Look to Framing Question 4, I think, probably the fourth video. You can talk, we can see her. But I've told you pretty much everything you need to know. Jack Robinson just talked about him, as I know, as we talked about Negro League ball player who went to white Major League Baseball. Who were Earl and Louise Little, the parents of Malcolm X? What organization did they belong to? They did not belong to the Nation of Islam. They came before the Nation of Islam. Earl Little from Georgia, Louise Little raised in Canada, but her people were from Grenada. Malcolm X's mother was from Grenada, uh, Caribbean. So uh, they belonged to the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World, Marcus Garvey's organization, Omaha, Nebraska, then uh, Michigan, where Earl Little was killed by a kind of clan wannabe organization. Who was gonna murder all? Gunnar Murdahl was a Swedish social scientist who was brought in by the Carnegie Foundation to study race in America. And he used black scholars like Sterling Brown and others, Ralph Bunch, and they put together something called The American Dilemma. The, An American Dilemma was the name of the book that was the Murdahl published. He said, the American Dilemma is race. Duh. Emmett Lewis Till. Uh, Emmett Lewis Till, people from Mississippi. He was raised in Chicago. His mother, Mamie, uh, after she sent the 14-year-old boy down south to be, to be with his people, um, he got down there, he got lynched by these white boys who claimed that he said something to one of them's wife, and I won't name them because they should remain forever obscure. Um, how did his mother's decision to share her grief with the world because once they brought the body back to Chicago, she made them have an open casket funeral. Uh, Johnny Johnson published the pictures in Jet Magazine and it shocked the conscience of black, the black world and many black people, including people who were in SNCC, who are still alive, like the great Dory Ladner, who lives here in DC, her sister Joyce, who was the interim president of Howard University for a year and a half, brilliant sociologist herself. They said those pictures is what shocked us because we were the age of Emmett Till and it kind of galvanized the black freedom struggle. That casket, by the way, of course, as we know, is in the Museum of African-American History and Culture. Oh, by the way, Emmett Till's father, Louis Till, was a veteran of the uh, of World War II. He had been executed for, uh, they accused him of raping white women, but they accused a lot of black men of having sex with white women in 
uh, France during the war and he was killed and he's buried in the segregated, segregated cemetery in, uh, in France. They sent his personal effects home. And one of the things that Mamie got from her husband who had been court-martialed and killed by the United States Army was a ring. It was that ring that was on Emmett Till's finger when he was killed. And that's one of the ways they identified his body. He had his daddy's ring on. Both of them killed by white people. Events. Hmm. Sorry. Events. What were the three major events of 1492 that signified the rise of the modern world system and the integration of forced African labor into the European slave trade? Columbus. 1492, Christopher Columbus comes west. The death of Askia the Great uh, in West Africa, weakening of West African level six social structures and uh, systems. And, uh, and 1492 marks a peak year in the Africans and Arab Muslims who are in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal being pushed out. And that's when you see Europe begin to expand. Emancipation Day, we just talked about that. Compensated Emancipation Day, that was last week, April 16th, every year. What tradition among Africans in the Western Hemisphere is it a part of? Those are kind of rites of emancipation. In the Caribbean, it's often in August. Many years in Black America, it was January the 1st, which is when the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to go into effect. Three American Revolutions. We talked about this many times, y'all. That's <clears throat> in Chapter 1. Three American Revolutions, the white elites versus the white colonial uh, colonizers, meaning George III versus George Washington and them the white poor versus the white elites, and then the blacks and the Native Americans versus everybody trying to get free. Impact of the Haitian Revolution, 1804, we talked about that a lot. Go back to framing question four on the idea of African governance. Once Haiti got free, black people in the hemisphere wanted to get free. According to a slide in framing question four, five stages of the formation of the modern US state from 1860 to the present. Look at those PowerPoints, framing question five, PowerPoints have been posted. Frame question four, if you go to the Sankofa site and go to the second video, frame question four, two, I talk about that fairly extensively. Actually go to four, three. Four, three, I do a little bit more. According to Eric Hobsbawm, quoted by Cedric Robinson, <clears throat> what role did the limits of expansion play in the struggle between European states and each other, as well as between those states and their former white controlled colonies from the mid 19th through the mid 20th centuries? In summary, Virgil asked about colonialism earlier. This is what's called the limits of expansion, meaning what? Once you've gone everywhere you can go and you don't have any place else you can claim, then you start fighting other people who claim stuff to take their stuff. That's why Du Bois said the roots of the war was Europe had reached the limits, some limits of expansion, and now they're gonna try to take stuff from each other. Germany wanted to bogart colonies, different places, among other things, and that's what triggers the war. Manifest destiny, God told us to take the land. We talked about that in class. Major post-1787 compromises. Don't really worry about this one. I'll write it in the draft text, but if you go to frame in question four, that's also uh, where I'm talking about these five stages of the U.S. state. So go to that, uh, four three and, and review that. Principle of the involuntary sacrifice. That means that black people fought in these wars, not because they wanted to, but because they thought that was the best path to freedom. Dred and Harriet Scott, uh, they, of course, that's a complicated story we talked about. They are buried in Missouri, near Ferguson, Missouri, in St. Louis. Why does their story impact the concept of black citizenship to this day? Uh, Dred Harriet Scott, of course, formerly enslaved Africans, Fort Snelling in near St. Paul, Minnesota, um, come back to the South. They tell them, just because you were in a free territory don't mean you free down here. Case goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says, no, there are no rights that uh, black people have in this country that, black, that, that are written in stone. White people can make you whatever we want to make you. And that's really affects black citizenship to this day. John Brown. Uh, John Brown was the white dude who jumped off a fight at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. He had spent time in Kansas. He had come from the East Coast to do that. He tried to set off a rebellion of enslaved Africans. And that helped kind of facilitate the Civil War in some ways because people realized it's going to end violently. What were the contraband acts? Contraband acts were when the Civil War jumped off, the North said anything we take from the South becomes our property. We call it contraband of war. That included 4 million African people. Africans then used that to join the Union Army lines and some of them joined the Union Army and ended up fighting for our own liberation. What was the position that Mexico held toward the institution of enslavement before the US Civil War? Again, all these we really cover in frame question four and five. You have those videos, you'll have five today. Uh, Mexico, 
abolish enslavement. That's why if we had been at the Alamo, we would have been fighting against Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie, not with them. Before the U.S. Civil War, uh, what were the most proper, where were the most prosperous U.S. states? They were in the South. After the war, where were they? They were in the North. In fact, let me do this very quickly. There is a map, map 72. You see before and after. Let me see, because I can't see myself here. Yeah. You see before where those states are. You see after where those states are. They're no longer in the South. African labor did that shift because you had all that free labor of African people in the South after the war. They ain't slaves no more. They're not enslaved. General Sherman was a U.S. Army general that marched to the sea. What activity did he undertake that he undertook during the end of the U.S. Civil War led to uh, moving, hold on a second, uh, free, Sherman's march to the sea is map 71. Y'all can see that map for yourselves, the march to the sea. All right. How did Africans spring themselves from enslavement in the South impact the Confederacy's war efforts and prospects? Well, once they stopped working, Du Bois writes about that in Black Reconstruction. He calls the general strike. Once they stop working, it collapses, helps collapse the Southern economy. And then they start working with the North. And so, of course, that just, you know, helps the war effort. How did the Compromise of 1877 impact U.S. Southern state constitutions? As I told y'all, once the Blacks are abandoned, they put Jim Crow in place. And the Jim Crow laws are not federal laws. They are state laws. Well, with the exception of D.C. It's a whole other story. The state laws. So the state constitutions of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, they're the ones who say no interracial marriage, separate water fountains, separate schools. The partition of Africa took place in Berlin, Germany in 1884. In 1883, 1884, hold on for a second, I'll give you the map and then you can, we'll keep going. I just want to give it to you so you have it. Uh, let me go here. Yes, the partition of Africa, 1880. Here we are. This is the map, map number 85 in your map book. If you've got a PDF of that, share that. There's the partition of Africa. You can read it for yourselves at your leisure. When you can pause the video once you have it. The last country to abolish enslavement and win, we're looking at uh, Cuba, we're looking at Brazil, 1888. In fact, the end of slavery in the Western Hemisphere, I think it's the last map in that. No, no, the end of, hold on a second. The end of slavery in the Western Hemisphere is the last map in, no, sorry. Give me a second here. I thought I had it quickly, but yeah, no, I had to find another time. Anyway, y'all can look at it. It's called the end of slavery in the Western Hemisphere. There's a map on that. The Battle of Adwa, it happened in Ethiopia, 1896. It inspired Africans worldwide in their struggles against oppression because the Ethiopians beat the Italians and the world went around, world went around the world. Pleasant versus Ferguson, of course, we know separate but equal is not legal in the American Constitution, 14th Amendment and 5th Amendment. That was 1954. Brown versus Board of Education was the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Brown, Brown versus Board of Education was the 1954 case. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 said that separate was constitutional as long as it was equal, but it could never be made equal. And that was what Charles Hamilton Houston, the dean, vice dean of Howard Law School, trained his students to attack. And Thurgood Marshall was his greatest student. We talked a little bit about them earlier. Participation of American Americans in World War I, we talked about that, the 369th, the 370th being the two major regiments. Uh, the Red Summer of 1919, they came back to the United States fighting. We returned fighting. And because they were trying to lynch black people in their army uniforms in the South, saying, what are you doing with that? Take that flag off. I'm like, no, nah, y'all go to hell. They, so much blood flowed, they called it the Red Summer, 1919. Chicago had one of the big uh, insurrections. Looking at my friend Eve Ewing's book, 1919. She wrote a court book about it, poetry book. Even though African-American women struggled to help women obtain the vote with the 19th Amendment, Ida Wells, when we talked about her, when for all intents and purposes did African-American women receive legal protection to enforce that right? As my colleague, Lethia Watkins Beatty always talks about, with the Voting Rights Act, same as black men, 1965. Why did Africans move to cities in the US, Caribbean, and Africa during the late 19th century through the 20th century? Jobs. What specifically, why specifically did Africans from the United States South migrate to cities in the North, Midwest, and the West Coast? We talked about that, World War II, those jobs. We talked about A. Philip Randolph, 1940s and 50s. Who was out of Bell Wells? Barnett, just talked about her, born in Holly, Holly Springs, Mississippi. 
What major issue did she champion near the beginning of the 20th century? She was against lynching and wrote a whole lot of books and fought and was a journalist, had a newspaper against it. Who was Yasantiwa? We talked about her on Tuesday. What struggle did she fight against the British? Talked again about her again today. The Ghanaian Queen Mother who fought British colonialism. The Yasantiwa War of 1901. Who were Nanny and Paul Bogle? Talked about them as well in class and again in framing question five. They were Jamaicans. How are they remembered through Jamaican currency? They fought against colonialism too. Maroons. They are on the money in Jamaica, as you Jamaicans know. What did the so-called Harlem Renaissance signify? How is the title different than the New Negro Movement? And why must it be recognized that this movement, let me see, that this movement was not restricted to Harlem or even like the Negritude Movement to the US. This is my friend Jeffrey Stewart's book, The New Negro. That's Elaine Lott, Lock Hall, Howard University. The time they gonna tear down Lock Hall, I don't know. Anyway, I'll believe anything when I see it. The idea is that the new Negro is the phrase that many blacks began referring to themselves as. They weren't the Africans who came out of enslavement. They're not gonna come to the North and just get beat up. Not that those other ones would have either, but the Harlem Renaissance is like a social structure name for the governance, the ways of knowing that is going on in black communities. That was not a name they called themselves. And because the white people who encountered this movement did it in New York, they, they kind of, uh, focused on Harlem, when in fact that explosion, the new Negro movement was everywhere. What African country did Africans from the United States and Caribbean try to sign up to fight for and against colonial imperialists in 1934-35? The same one that beat the Italians in 1896, Ethiopia. What African country looked extensively at the United States structure of Jim Crow to help it design its anti-Black policies? South Africa, Jan, J-A-N, Christian, as in Christians, Smuts, S-M-U-T-S. Visited Howard University, said, y'all train Negroes over here. We're going to train some Blacks over here to be an elite class. Bantu education is what they called it. And South Africa looked at the United States. Double V, we talked about that, the Pittsburgh Courier. So we'll keep going. What political party did Africans in the U.S. join during the South during Reconstruction? Republicans, we talked about that. Under what U.S. president did Africans in the United States make the transition to vote for Democrats rather than the Republican Party and why? Remember I said, the racists in the Democratic Party leave the Repu Democratic Party, go to the Republican Party in the 1960s and 70s. Before that, Blacks who migrated north to places like Chicago found that they were Republicans in the South. When they came north, they found out the political party that had the juice was the Democrats. And so they began to, to kind of think about the Democratic Party, but it was really with the election of the former governor of New York in the 1930s. This would be Franklin Delano Roosevelt to be the president. And after the Great Depression, it was Roosevelt who pushed for these social programs that put a floor under people, even though they too were racist. But uh, in terms of the programs, they were administered very much uh, in, along racial lines. But black people then started voting Democratic. And of course, then you see a wave of black people force themselves into the Democratic Party in the South during the Civil Rights Movement, because that's the party of white supremacy. And then the Democrats began white Democrats began leaving the Democratic Party, moving to the Republican Party. And that's how they ended up in the Republican Party. They don't believe in the Republican Party ideology, many of them. They just believe in, they don't want to be in no party with black people, where black people could actually have control. Who was the Bandung Conference? We talked about that, the Non-Aligned Conference of 1955. How did the possibility of African alliances with movements and organizations beyond the U.S. influence domestic policy? That's in framing question five, uh, we posted today. You also, we also talked about that in the review earlier. When did indigenous people in the United States, like American Indians, become legal citizens of the U.S. as a group? 1924. 1924. Some of y'all know people who were alive. They now nearing 100 years old. My mother's born in 29, so they'd only been legally citizens as a group in, for five years before she was born. What renaming activity has the United South African government undertaken in the country's capital city of Shwani or Pretoria? We just talked about that Tuesday. They changed the street, street names. During and after the U.S. Civil War, and again, during after the World War II, why did Africans in the U.S. begin to convert major narratives of African identity to narratives of resistance that also commingled with narratives of settler national state formation? In a sentence, Black people thought, many Black elites, thought that Americanization would be the best path toward achieving group liberation, certainly individual advancement. And that's the logic that informs a lot of the ways that Africans in this country, the black elites, narrate black identity, uh, even up to and including things like the 1619 Project. We built this country, we're part of this country, this country is racist, but we will make it a perfect, a more perfect union. Okay. 
What role did and do the international finance system and the international system of state serve in perpetuating unequal power relationships? That's kind of obvious on this space. We talked about that a little bit in frame of question five. After World War II, well, what two post-World War II economic and political organizations were created to facilitate the perpetuation of the modern world system? The International Money Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, all these institutions really flower after World War II. They kind of help put together what people will call now the so-called international community. Capital I, capital C, the international community, meaning these formal institutions, Western anchored institutions, to be distinguished from the people of the world. We're not talking about everybody in the world as an international community. We're talking about institutions which kind of form the framework. The World Health Organization, for example, of course, which you've all been thinking and reading and listening to and about over the last month. What was the document called We Charge Genocide? We talked about that in framing question five. How is it evidence of an African-American connection to international struggles for human rights? That's Louise Thompson Patterson and William Patterson. That's Islam de Good Robeson and Paul Robeson. That's Shirley Graham Du Bois and W.E.B. Du Bois. That's uh, Addie Hunton and Alphaeus Hunton. These are the Africans in the United States who are connecting uh, what's going on in the Black people in the United States to the world. And they go before the United Nations and say, we charge genocide based on this framework of genocide that has been articulated by the capital I, capital C international community. When did Zimbabwe celebrate its first Independence Day? 1980. What African Jamaican artists did they invite to promote, to perform at the celebration? Y'all know, Bob Marley. And why? Marley recorded a song on Zimbabwe and he was seen as part of this international solidarity movement with Zimbabwe. What were the traditional dates for the civil rights movement? 1955, Montgomery bus boycott, 1965, the Voting Rights Act. The Black Power era, you have a rebellion in Watts, urban insurrection, 1860, uh, 1965. That's when they usually start the Black Power era in the history books, the textbooks. And then they end it in the mid 1970s, 75, 76, really kind of indeterminate. But again, those are just textbook dates. The long movements go back before then, extend after then. Ella Jo Baker, born in Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, what role did she play in founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? She was a executive secretary of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, worked with Martin King, uh, a woman who worked with Dr. King, along with Septima Clark, the first woman to be on the SCLC board, Septima Clark out of uh, South Carolina. But Ella Jo Baker was kind of like the advisor to the young people in who created the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They wanted her to lead them. She said, I won't lead you, but I will advise you. I'll play the role of elder, which is why she's still beloved to this day in the old head SNCC folks who are still alive. Uh, and that's the role she played. And that's why they went to Shaw to start SNCC because she had gone to school at Shaw. She's a Shaw University graduate. When are the parents of Trayvon Martin, Jordan Davis, and Michael Brown? Trayvon Martin, of course, out of Florida. Jordan Davis out of uh, Georgia. And Michael Brown out of uh, Missouri. Jordan Davis' mom now, of course, is the United States, uh, Lucy McBath out of in the United States Congress. Where did they travel internationally? Geneva, Switzerland, where the, where the UN has its headquarters, in Geneva and in New York. That's also where they delivered the We Charge genocide petitions to gener two generations before. So they went to Geneva to testify on behalf of the most recent African-inspired U.S. social movement, which is the Black Lives Matter movement. How did this follow the tradition of African-American leaders like Paul and Essie Robeson, Shirley and W.B. Du Bois, and Louise and William Patterson? I just told y'all, internationalize the struggle. Almost done, two left. In what region of the United States are the largest number of countries, or counties rather, where African people are the numerical majority? It's the place being hit hard, the South. How do black political elites benefit from black mass movements? Well, when black people move as a group in any country, the black elites also benefit because they too are black. How might their particular political participation moderate rather than accelerate black, black mass movements? Well, once there is some advancement made, the black elites are in closer proximity to the social structure in terms of access to power, access to influence, and often that serves as a moderating force. So when the Robesons and the Pattersons and the Thompsons were saying, we charge genocide, the United States government, business leaders and others went to some of the black elites like Walter White and others and said, look, these people here, they kind of connected to communism and this African independence movement. Maybe you need to distance yourself from them because they're threatening your uh, advancement. And some of them did turn their backs, like Roy Wilkins and them, kind of backed up off of being supportive of people like W.E.B. Du Bois. And so um, I think that's it. 
So let's go back. I'll just put this back on the screen as we end, because now I'm, I'm missing this other meeting. Uh, these are the instructions. Um, you'll get the, oh, I'm just gonna read this once, be done with it, because some people may have come on after the first 20 minutes. So this will be the last thing we do today. Introduction to Afro-American Studies 1, Spring 2020 Final Exam Review Sheet. The COVID-19 pandemic requires us to radically alter the format of our final exam. This exam will consist of two essay questions worth 40% of the examination each and a multiple choice question test worth 20%. Multiple choice exam portion of the final exam will be available on Blackboard from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. a week from today, next Thursday. So in fact, we, in about 23 minutes, we'll be at the end of that period. The essay portion of the final exam will be due on Thursday, same day, next week, by 11.59 on Blackboard. Also, the bi-weekly essays, framing questions uh, five and six, if you want to do six, six is optional, those will be due on May the 1st. Uh, in fact, I'll add that. The final exam essays will be posted on Blackboard, sent to you by email by tomorrow, Friday, April 24th. I'll try to get it in the morning, no later than noon. The two essay questions, and then you'll have until next Thursday to answer. Two essay questions should be answered in no fewer than three and no more than six pages each. Three apiece, three and four, three and five, six and six, however you want to combine it. But you do have to answer both of them. Type double space, submit it on Blackboard. Remember, Blackboard is going to check for plagiarism. So, you know, description for penalty for that on the syllabus remains the same. Draft text discussions of framing, four, framing questions four, five, and six. I'm going to post those on Blackboard by Monday. So you have, in addition to whatever else you have, if you don't have all your books, you'll have these. I'll give you these chap these kind of descri descriptions. To give everyone more content to cite from and answering the essay questions and helping to study for the multiple choice section of the exam. Uh, review tip for the final exam. Look at those PowerPoints. I've posted four. I've posted five. I will post six this afternoon just so you have it. And uh, the video, this video, uh, when we get off, I'm going to put it in the Dropbox for Sankofa to upload it to uh, Sankofa sites. I don't know when that's going to be. I'm hoping it'll be by this time tomorrow, but uh, I'll send it to them this afternoon. They'll have it before I go back into class at 3.40 after I do these meetings in between. Okay. I miss y'all. I guess it's the last class of the year. What the hell? I just thought about that. Don't get sentimental, son. All right, I will, uh, I will, in fact, I'll reach out to you all by email today. Uh, Ms. Carter has put a couple of pieces in. Yes, I am posting the recording and I'm gonna stop recording in a second and talk to you all shortly, okay? Y'all be good. I'm going to send you an email. I think maybe we will do one more uh, together. And I may ask everybody to do it together. Maybe just 15, 20 minutes, a quick Q&A. And uh, maybe I'll do that next Tuesday while you're in the middle of writing essays. If anybody has any questions or things. In fact, I will do that. I'll do that. And I'll schedule it at a time when a little bit, little bit later in the day, people have some time. And then, you know, we'll get a chance to wrap this up right. Okay, y'all be safe. Love to your families. Be safe. Be yeah. safe, Dr. Carr. Appreciate you. Too, you. very much. Absolutely. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Have a good one. You too, sweetheart. You too.